Oh, okay. Today is uh, looking at certainly our talks here will not be only on personal experience or our personal perceptions, attitudes, but these will color our presentations. When we talk about facts, they, they are colored, they are modified, modulated by whatever we felt, we experienced. And uh, bearing in mind that each doctor patient's consultation situation or contact is different. I fear that the published literature by itself is not quite sufficient for us to get to that point where we are confident, whatever the situation is, we are prepared to give our best and provide the best outcome to our patients. So what we are doing today, and thank you to the organizers and the speakers, is to get that personal touch. How do my colleagues treat or uh, uh, resolve certain issues? What are their thoughts and that personal touch? So again, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Eugene, Dr. Anita, for organizing this, and the speakers, Dr. Kain, Dr. Javed, and Dr. Joseph. One other thing, when I went through the titles of the talks for today, I was uh, surprised, but pleasantly so. Looking at the titles, uh, they didn't seem to be titles which are specific to women's health or some titles that I wouldn't see in a section under women's health in a textbook. So should we be disappointed? Well, I did say pleasantly, so this is not a complaint, this is a compliment. I think the organizers are sending us a message to say, women's health is not impacted only by diseases or conditions specific to women, but by many others. So it's a good message that we all should keep in mind. So that is why I'm happy that we are dealing with some issues which are not specific to women, but certainly can impact women's health considerably. So, with that opening remarks, and again, welcoming everyone, uh, I shall now pass on to Dr. Anita to continue with the main agenda of the day, and that's these talks on the three topics titles that we have today. Thank you. Over to Dr. Anita. Thank you, Prof. Roland, for the, those uh, introductory remarks. I would like to start this uh, session uh, with a quote by a uh, famous American poet and philosopher who said, women are the civilizing influence in life. So it, you know the importance of women's health from that. So Prof. Roland was saying why there were topics uh, which were the, just uh, away from, apart from women's health. So, you know, taking care of the child is also one of the work of the women. So women plays a lot, lot of role in the family as well as in the, for the nation and also at the international level. They hold a lot of uh, higher positions and uh, um, it's very important to talk about uh, not only women's health, but also the you know, family. Okay, so that's why uh, uh, Prof. Eugene has come up with uh, different uh, varieties of topic uh, so that uh, it will also uh, have uh, influence on their audience to know about the importance of women's health. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Women's Health Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Anita from School of Medicine, Taylor's University. This session mainly focuses on three topics today. That is HPV infection, HPV vaccine, and cervical cancer, followed by headache and migraine in women, and the last topic would be how to recognize autism in a young child. So all these topics are delivered by our three in-house speakers, Dr. Kain, Dr. Javi, and Dr. Joseph from School of Medicine, Taylor's University. The time limit for each lecture is 50 minutes. So following that, we'll have a Q&A session at 6.15. 
So after completion of all the lectures, however, if there is extra time after the lecture, the speaker can take questions posted in the chat box. The session will end by 6.30 p.m. with a closing note by our organizing person, Prof. Eugene. So the credit mainly goes to Prof. Eugene for organizing this uh, Women's Health series and also for Prof. Roland and Prof. Uh, Lai for supporting this. For Q&A session, please key in your questions in the chat box. Now, allow me to set the ball rolling with the introduction of our esteemed speakers. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce the speaker of the first topic of this lecture series, Dr. Kain, my colleague in ONG, and also senior lecturer from School of Medicine, Taylor University. She did her undergraduation in Institute of Medicine, Yangon, Myanmar, in 2004, and she obtained her master's in ONG from University of Malaya in 2010, and postgraduate diploma in medical education from University of Dundee in 2017. After her post-graduation from UM, she worked as a clinical specialist in ONG in UM until 2014, and as a clinical assistant professor in Utah until 2018, before joining Taylor's University. For the second lecture, the speaker is Dr. Javid. He is a senior lecturer in surgery from School of Medicine, graduated from Kabul Medical University, Afghanistan in 2002. He did his master's in general surgery and neurosurgical training in University of Malaya in 2007 and 2012 respectively. He worked as a clinical fellow in the Department of Cardiology and Surgery at University of Malaya Medical Center from 2008 to 2009 and in the Division of Neurosurgery at UMMC from 2009 to 2012 before joining Taylor's. He also did advanced neurosurgical training in Hospital Sungai Bulo until 2019 and has fellowship on spine disorder from Royal Adelaide Hospital and neurovascular fellowship from the St. Louis University Hospital, Missouri. And the final topic, the speaker in uh, Taylor's University in psychiatry department, he graduated in medicine from Hasturba Medical College in Mangalore in 1989 and did his master's in psychiatry in University of Malaya in 2003. He worked as a MO in MOH from 1991 to 1995 and as a consultant psychiatrist after graduating from UM until 2008. He joined International Medical Corps and works as a mental health coordinator in Jordan until 2011. He returned to home country to serve the home country and started working as a senior lecturer in Penang Medical College until 2014. During that tenure, he was also a consultant psychiatrist at Apollo and Pantai Medical Center in Taiping and Penang respectively. Currently, he also does consultation at Valley Psych Specialist, Bangsa, Mind Faculty, Solaris Montiara, and also at Health Equities Initiatives, NGO for Mental Health of Displaced Persons. All the speakers, they all did their post-graduation in University of Malaya. So mm, that is the mm, uniform thing for our, our esteemed speakers. So the speakers have membership in renowned professional bodies, also publication in peer-reviewed journal, ebook. They have presented at local, national, and international conference and uh, meetings, and have secured grants at regional levels. So without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker, Dr. Kain, to deliver a lecture on HPV infection, HPV vaccine, and cervical cancer. Welcome, Dr. Kain. Thank you so much, Dr. Anita, for your kind introduction. Thanks a lot, Prof. Roland, and special thanks to Prof. Eugene for uh, uh, allowing me to, giving me a chance to share about the HPV topics in this webinar. Can, can I share the slides? Ruben, can I share the slides? Okay, Doctor. I can't still. Sure. Here, Doctor, I made you co host. Good. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. Can you see my slides? Can see, Doctor. Okay, thanks. So uh, in today's webinar, I'm going to cover this, these topics, HPV infection and its related disease in both men and women, and symptoms associated with HPV infection and cervical cancer. What are the diagnostic tests available for HPV infection and cervical cancer? And how are we going to manage about the HPV infection as well as the cervical cancer? And how are we going to prevent HPV vaccine? And uh, Prof. Eugene, even though this is the the Women Health Series, can you please allow me to share about the HPV in men and immunization in men just for a little bit? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. All right, so uh, for the cervical cancer, it is the third leading cause of uh, female cancer in Malaysia. And um, uh, from the women's uh, age between the 15 to 44 years, it becomes the second most common female cancer. Uh, this slide, this is the incidence rate in uh, Malaysia uh, for female. Uh, is is stood is it is it stood as the third place uh, after the breast cancer and colorectal cancer. So how about the mortality rate? So mortality rate it become the number fourth um, female cancer of the highest mortality rate after the C A breast C A lungs and see follow, followed by the CA cervix. So in the Southeast Asia, but um, um, I think that's a good, good thing. So Malaysia stood as the number three in the lowest incidence rate for the cervical cancer. But unfortunately, my, my country, Myanmar, it become the second most highest incidence rate for the cervical cancer. So um, I would like to start with what is HPV? HPV stands for the, we all know that HPV stands for the human papillomavirus. And it is a DNA virus and it, is, it has a, about a 150 species of the viruses. So we can, uh, for out of this more than 150, there are the, basically two types of the HPV which is relevant for our, our uh, in the medical field. One is the low risk HPV, which is uh, HPV 6 and 11. It can lead to the, uh, the genital warts in both men and women. Another type is uh, high-risk HPV and 16 and 18. It can, call, it, can, it can lead to the cancers in both men and women. Okay, now <clears throat> I would like to touch on the mode of transmission. So mode of transmission, uh, majority, uh, a majority of the HPV is transmitted via the sexual route through the sexual cause, either vagina or anal or oral sexual intercourse. Condom can prevent to help to reduce the risk 100% reduction in uh, transmission of the HPV infection. And uh, how about the non-sexual route? Yes, from the mother to fetus, there are the studies done, and then it shows that uh, from the, there, there might be the vertical transmission of the HPV from the mother to the newborn fetus. So now let's look at the HPV related cancer. So it's a very well known that HPV can cause cervical cancer. And then minority <clears throat> in the minor percentage, it can cause the CA vagina and CA vulva. So high risk HPV is associated with 95% of the cervical cancer, which is the squamous cell carcinoma. And it can also lead to the CA penis in the men and CA uh, uh, inner cancer <clears throat> and oropharyngeal cancer in both men and women. So now <clears throat> there is a news about the silent epidemic of cancer is spreading among the men because we all know that HPV can link to the female cancer. So how about in the men? So it also shows that as it is a sexually transmitted infection and the more sexual partners someone had the bigger the risk so the study found that smoking also increased the risk of the high-risk infection and men and women who smoke marijuana 
are also more likely to develop cancer related to the HPV infection. Okay, so because of the national cancer screening, which is the pap smear and HPV DNA testing, so we can see that the trend of the incidence rate for the cervical cancer is coming down. But at the same time, there are the increased incidence of the adenic cancer, oropharyngeal carcinoma, in both men and women because of HPV infection. So let's see, starting from the HPV infection to development of the cancer, it might take years or even decades from the starting from the infection to the development of the cancer. Therefore, from here to here, then we can do the, a lot of activities and then screening and prevention to prevent the malignancy from happening. So, HPV infection, most of the HPV infection are transient and they will go away without any symptoms within one year. Exception is if we have the weak immune system, if we have diabetic, if we have malignancy, if we have HIV, and then the HPV cannot go away by itself and it can develop into the other health problem, likely, most likely malignancies. So we all know that if HPV is long lasting and it was not detected in the earlier stage, it can lead to the cervical cancer, 95% of the cervical cancer. So now I would like to share about the symptoms associated with HPV infection. So once you get HPV infection, it is totally asymptomatic and it will go away by itself just now like I mentioned. And it doesn't go away, it can lead to the genital warts and cancers. So here are the genital warts. It can happen in the male as well as the female. And how about the cervical cancer? Cervical cancer also, it doesn't have symptoms until it is very advanced and serious. So what are the warning symptoms of cervical cancer? As some of you might know, can have the abnormal vaginal bleeding and post bleeding, post-menopausal bleeding and offensive vaginal discharge. But when they come with these symptoms, most of the time it is a quite late, late stage. So from the, this is the natural history of the high-risk HPV infection until the progression of cervical cancer from the normal cervix to the HPV infected cervix. And if the HPV infection is persistent, and if we don't detect from the premalignant condition, it may lead to the cervical cancer. So here, HPV infection can disappear after one year by itself if our immune system is strong enough. If not, if there's a persistent infection, after two years, it will be a persistent infection. And after two to five years, it will change into the low-grade pre-malignant condition. And if we don't detect at the stage of low-grade, it will lead into the high-grade pre-malignant disease. And then if we don't treat the high-grade pre-malignant disease, it can lead to the invasive cervical cancer. So please have a look. From the starting from the HPV infection until the invasive cancer, it might take nine to 15 years. So we have a lot of times from and a lot of steps and we can cut the change to prevent the invasive cancer. So this is the normal looking cervix to the invasive cancer. And this is the pre-malignant changes. So, here is, this one is quite advanced. So this is the CIN, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, pre-malignant changes, go into the invasive cervical carcinoma. Now, 
how are we going to screen the cervical cancer? So we have already known that we can screen by the pap smear. And then nowadays, we can also screen by the HPV DNA testing because 95% of the cervical cancer is because of the HPV, high-risk HPV. So this is the, how we are doing the pap smear. We can do in the clinic setting, in the lithotomy position. And then we just need to put the speculum in, Costco speculum, and we just need to take the uh, cell sample from the transformation cell. So pap smear also there are two types. Conventional type is a pap test. Another one is a liquid-based cytology using a cytobrush or cytobrush. So this is a conventional pap test. So what we need is we need a Costco speculum, either metal or either plastic, or and we need a wooden spatula, and we need a cytobrush, cyto brush, and we need a glass light. So this is pap smear is currently in this moment is a primary method of detection of the cervical cancer, screening for cervical cancer. And our reporting system is according to the Bethesda system. And with the conventional pap test, cervical samples, the cell that we obtain are smeared into the glass light and we fix into the alcohol. And then after that, we were sent to the lab. And another type is the liquid-based cytology. So we use the cytobrush or cytobroom and we would get the smear from the cervix and we will put into the, this solution, thin prep solution. And sometimes we have to break the sample, the tip of the brush, and we will send together with the water and send to the lab. So another type is the visual inspection of the cervix by using the acetic acid or lupal iodine. In the rural area where we have the limited resources, we can use this method. We can use the 5% acetic acid or lugar iodine and we stained the cervix and then we fix for a while and then we will see whether there is an abnormal area in the cervix. So this is how we take the PEP test and we have to get the transformation zone. So when do we call the optimal PEP smear? Sometimes the lab results come back as a it is an inadequate or insufficient pap smear. But what do we call sufficient pap smear? So the optimal pap smear contains a sufficient measure and metaplastic squamous cell, which indicate the adequate sampling from whole of the transformation zone. Later, I will show you what the transformation zone is. And then it also obtained the endocervical cell, indicating the upper limit of the transformation zone is sampled. And so we can also sample from the adenoplasma. So here is the transformation zone of the cervix. So outside is a squamous cell, is lined by the squamous cell. And inside of the cervix is lined by the columnar. So this is a squamocolumnar junction. And here is a squamocolumnar junction. So here is a pink area, is made of squamous cell. And this darker area is made of the glandular cell, columnar cell. And this here is a squamous, the transformation zone, squamous columnar junction. So just now, I mentioned that we need to take the pap smear either by using the spatula or cytobrush or cytobrum. So this is the cervix. And we have to take the sample like this, and we have to twist 360 degrees. And this one is the appearance of the cervix, how the cervix look like in the reproductive age group. And on the right side is how the cervix look like in the menopausal, postmenopausal women. So please have a look at the transformation zone. Since we have to take the, get a smear from the transformation zone, and here is where the transformation zone is for the women of the reproductive age. But however, if we become menopause, the transformation zone is going inward. Therefore, if we want to take the pap smear for the postmenopausal women, we need to get the pointed end of the wooden spatula or either cytobroom or cytobrush to reach the inner part of the transformation zone. 
So after we take the smear, we take the cells, we have to select, we have to select on the glass slide. So this is a wooden spatula, how we slide it down. And this is the cytobloom, we select like that. And this is the cytobrush, we select like that. And after that, we fix with the alcohol solution and we send to the lab. And now this is the liquid-based cytology. So liquid-based cytology, we use the cytobloom. We take the cell, we will take 360 degree. After that, we have to push into the bottle containing the solution about nine to 10 times. And after that, we can send the tip of the brush together with the bottle to the lab. And here is the, if we use the wooden spatula, we have to spill it into the bottle nine to 10 times to take the cells all, to put the cells all inside the bottle and send to the lab. Same things go for the cyto brush. This also called that this is a thin prep, liquid-based cytology. So now I would like to share what's the difference, what are the difference between a conventional pap smear and liquid-based cytology. So in a conventional pap smear, majority of cells are not captured or lost when the sampling device is discarded. Because we just remember, we just need to slide on the glass slide. And after that, we just need to put the sampling device, either cyto brush or either the, the uh, with a spatula inside the yellow bin where we discard the medical medical waste. So, so majority of cells may not be captured. And sometimes it will happen the clumping and overlapping of the cells. And then we may have the mucus or blood discharge and it may affect on the quality of the cervical smear that we got. And there is a 9.1% 9, 9 chance of the inadequate sample. But how about the liquid-based cytology? So in the liquid-based cytology, since we put all, most of the cell inside the bottle, and then we were sent together with the sampling device, most of the, most or all the cell samples are collected and distribution is very even and minimize the uh, mucus and blood and increase the detection of the high grade lesion by 59% and low grade lesion by 12%. And there is a very little chance of having an inactive grade sample, which is only 1.6% compared to 9.1% in the conventional pap smear. So now, how are we going to do the screening for cervical cancer in the women? So here is the guideline. So uh, we, were starting, we will start the screening from 21 years of age. So starting from 21 to 29 years, we will do that. Pap smear alone is every three years. HPV test only indicated for the triage of the abnormal cell result. After we do the pap smear, abnormal cell result, then we can do the HPV test. Or treated, if we have already treated a high grade lesion, we will check the test of cure for the abnormal pap smear results. So basically, if uh, for the normal female of 21 to 29 years of age, PEP test alone is enough and we will do for three years. From the 30 years of age to 65 years of age, if we have the facility for HPV DNA testing, we can do the code testing and we don't need to test every three years. If the HPV, high risk HPV is negative, PEP smear is negative, she can come back only after five years. But after 50, 65 years, it is recommended that we, don't, we no longer need to do that cervical screening, unless, uh, unless she, is, she had a high-risk HPV test within the past 10 years, or she had the previous CIN, which is treated. And if someone has a hysterectomy because of the benign cases, benign disease like fibroid or adenomyosis or uh, benign ovarian cysts also, we don't need to do the pap smear anymore. We don't need to do the FOB smear anymore. So here is the reporting system of the cervical pathology test. So I would like to share the, how the each system different from, differ from each other in the definition. So uh, when we do the PEP test, then the result can be either one of it. So 
It can come back as a atypical squamous cell of undetermined significance. Atypical squamous cell, we cannot exclude the high-grade type or low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, which is a SGSIL, or high-grade squamous cell of intraepithelial lesion, HSIL, and ACOS, atypical glandular cell of or adenocarcinoma in situ. So here, this one is low-grade lesion is equivalent to CIN. High-grade lesion is a, the C, a, a low grade is CIN1. High-grade will be either CIN2 or CIN3, which is a, can be differentiated into mild dysplasia, moderate and severe dysplasia. If we have the atypical glandular cell, it is a carcinoma in situ. And then UK, Classification system also a bit different. They call it as, as a borderline dyscariosis, mild, moderate, and severe dyscariosis. So here are the roughly, I would like to share about the types of HPV tests. It can be divided into nucleic acid hybridization assay, signal amplification assays, and nucleic acid amplification assays. So why we want to use the HPV DNA testing? Because it is more sensitive than the cytology test alone, pap smear test alone, which is a 96% versus 53%. It is less specific. However, it is a high negative predictive value. And 16% reduction in high-grade lesion and 45% reduction in the borderline changes. So how about HPV DNA testing? When are we going to do? These are the three clinical the, the uses or implications of the HPV DNA testing. One is the triage of the borderline abnormalities. When the pap smear come back as borderline, then we will, do the, we will proceed with HPV DNA testing. And then just now I share about more than 30, 30 years of age after 60, 65 years, we can do as a core testing together with the pap smear, or we can do as a test of cure in the post-treatment patient. After the excision of the, bottom of the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, then we can check for the HPV DNA as a test of cure. So the fourth objective is uh, how are we going to manage if there is a HPV DNA testing become abnormal, and what are the treatment modalities for the abnormal pap smear, CIN, and cervical cancer? So normally, pap smear and HPV DNA testing, it might take two to three weeks to get the result. So we take the pap smear together with HPV DNA testing, and then we will ask the patient to come back after three weeks' time. So if the pap smear shows normal, they just need to follow up every year, regularly three years, every three years. But if the code testing, if you are doing, if we are doing the HPV code testing together with pap smear, both are negative, then they just need to come back after five years. But if let's say, if they become abnormal, the result is abnormal, it doesn't mean that the patient is having the invasive cancer in this moment. It just means that they need to do the further investigation and testing to check for the degree of dysplasia and what kind of further treatment that she might need to do. So these are the basic guidelines on uh, how are we going to proceed with the different uh, pap smear result. Normal pap smear is cells are normal. We will do the code and the HPV negative. We will do code co testing every five years. If the HPV is positive, then we will ask her to come back in a year time. And we will do the code testing again after one year. So if there's a low grade abnormality, it means that some cells found on the top of the cell, in the cervix are mildly abnormal. So if there's a low grade type, if the HPV is negative, we will repeat the pap smear in one year time. And HPV, high risk HPV are positive, we will proceed with the corposcopy. Later, I will share about the corposcopy. 
And if the back sphere come back as the high grade abnormalities, and at the same time, HPV is negative, then we will do the, we can do the immediate excision of corpuscopy. But if the HPV is positive or so, since it is a high grade, very high chance of getting into the invasive carcinoma. So we can do the treatment straight away, or we can pr we proceed with the corpuscopy. But if it is a glandular type, glandular is quite dangerous. It can lead to the adenocarcinoma. R uh, regardless of HPV condition, either positive or negative, we will do the corpuscopy immediately. And we still need to do the endometrial sampling to get the endometrial tissue to rule out the adenocarcinoma. All right. So next is the one are we going to call for corpuscopy? So just now, I've already shared about the inadequate sample. If the, the pap smear result come back as inadequate sample, and then we try to sample again, and again, come back as inadequate sample. If we got the inadequate samples for three times, we will call for corpuscopy. And if we have the borderline changes and high risk HPV is positive also, we will proceed. And or borderline endocervical cancer, endocervical cell, which is an atypical glandular cell of unknown significance, or LGSIL, high risk screamer intrabiotic radiation, and atypical screamer cell of unknown significance, high risk cannot be ruled out. If the patient is having the symptomatic, like post bleeding or offensive vaginal discharge, even the normal cytology with high risk HPV positive, then we will call for corpuscopy. So here is how the corpuscopy is done. So corpuscopy is the examination of the cervix under the microscope. And under the microscope, we will see the abnormal area, and then we can do the direct biopsy with the punch biopsy for cell. And we send to the um, histopathology report. So we can do conventional corpuscopy for the full HD video corpuscopy. So in the full HD video corpuscopy, patient can be involved in the process, patient can see, and instrument handling is facilitated. And uh, we, can, we can get the document and we can archive the findings in the patient record, either in the form of video clips, or we can use the images and we can put file in the record. So that one day, if someone needs to look back for the treatment of the patient, we have a record. So this is the, how we are going to see from the corpuscopy. So under the microscope, and we can see the either normal cervix, or we can see this kind of the abnormal changes, and which are saying that this is the pre-malignant lesion, either mosaic system of permutation, leukoplakia, atypical blood vessel, or acetoma changes. Or because in the corpuscopy, we can put the acetic acid first, and then we will see the color changes, and abnormal cell area will become the coagulation and become the acetobot, acetoma changes. Here, I would like to play a very short video clip on how the cervical abnormalities look like. Can you see the video and can you, can you see the video? Can see, doctor. All right, thanks, Kim. From the video, we can see the punctation, a lot of the red dots. 
and then uh, a lot of uh, new black vessels and then leukoplakia, which is a white color. So if we see if the if we have got the diagnosis of the pre-malignant changes, we can um, we can have the treatment, which is either excision of biopsy or we can do the ablation technique to as a test of cure, as a as a uh, as a treatment option, either large loop excision or transformation zone or cone biopsy or cryotherapy. Yeah? And at the same time, uh, the like for example, excision of biopsy, the cone biopsy, or large loop excision of transformation zone, we can get the tissue sample for histopathology report as well as the it is a treatment for the pre-malignant condition. So these treatment modalities achieve almost 90 to 95% cure rate. Defined by the, after six months later, we need to check again. And then uh, about 90 to 95% of the cases achieve the normal pap smear again. Hysterectomy may be suitable if other gynecologic problems coexist or if the local excision has failed. The last result is a hysterectomy. And uh, if we miss the pre-malignant uh, stage, and then um, unfortunately, if we catch only at the cervical cancer stage, and here are the treatment options. If there, it is an early stage, and it can be successfully treated, and five-year survival rate is very good, we can do the, we can have the surgical treatment. But however, if she was diagnosed in the later stage, we can do the surgery, but we cannot totally remove the malignant cells. And then she need to do the, she need to proceed with the either radiotherapy or chemotherapy, radio chemo, or radio, uh, and then combination of radiotherapy and chemotherapy as well. So here are the stages of cervical cancer. I try to simplify in a way that uh, is easier for us to understand. So uh, there are the four stages of the spike cancer. Stage one is the early stage. It is still confined in the cervix, but it has spread from the cervical lining into the deeper tissue of the cervix, but it's still in the cervix. Stage two is a spread beyond the uterus to the nearby area, but it is still inside the pelvic area. In the stage two, we can divide it into, again, divide into stage two A and two B. Stage 2A is limited to the upper third of the vagina. It hasn't spread to the parametrium. Stage 2B is spread to the parametrium, but it doesn't reach to the pelvic subway. Stage 3 is the malignancy is involved to the lower third of the vagina, is spread to the pelvic sidewall, and or involved the kidney, which is she can have the hydronephrosis at the ureter, and then it's spread to the regional lymph node, is a stage 3. Stage four, we all know that it's a distant metastasis. So stage four is a spread to the bladder and rectum, but it doesn't go to the lungs or liver or brain. But stage four B is spread to the different distant part of the body. It's a stage four. So uh, as I mentioned just now, if we diagnose the patient in the earlier stage. We can do the radical hysterectomy, which is the wall time hysterectomy, and we can get the very high rate of the successful and very high five year survival rate. So, radical hysterectomy is the removal of the uterus, total abdominal hysterectomy, and remove the cervix and upper vagina and the vaginal cup as well, and extensive pelvic lip node accession. And we will do together with a bilateral subclinical hysterectomy as well. All right. So this is the mainstay of treatment is a surgery if we detect in the early stage. But if she come in the later stage, one is a, we can do the radiation and we can do the chemotherapy and we can combine the chemo radiation. But nowadays, it's a good news. We have the newer treatment modality. We have the targeted therapy, which is a treatment that targets to the cancer-specific genes, proteins, and then tissue environment that contribute to the cancer growth 
and survival. So we were targeted to this gene so that the cancer malignancy will stop growing. This is the targeted therapy. Another one is the immunotherapy. We will modify the immune system of the patient and with the good immune system, the cervical cancer will be, the disease condition will be limited. So in the immunotherapy, very well-known pathway is a PDL1 pathway, which is a programmed death ligand protein pathway. And that's a very good news for the cervical cancer patient, although they are quite pricey and expensive. So these are the five-year survival rate for the cervical cancer. Stage one is 79, almost 80%. Stage two, 47%. So if they are found only at the stage three, the five-year survival rate is 22% and stage four is 7%. Squamous cell carcinoma tend to have the better survival rate than the adenocarcinoma. And um, squamous cell carcinoma are because of, mainly because of the HPV DNA virus. So the objective five is now we are going to uh, talk about, we are going to uh, see what kind of vaccines, what kind of prevention methods are available for the HPV. So starting from 2007, we, our pre primary prevention of the most survivor cancer is now available with the licensing of the first HPV vaccine in 2007. So to date, there are three types of HPV vaccines available, which are the Cervix, Gardasil, and Gardasil 9. All three types, they prevent against the high-risk HPV, which is 16 and 18, which can cause the 70% of the cervical cancer. And also other, it can also prevent the other HPV-associated cancer, such as the Pinai cancer, inner cancer, oropharyngeal cancer. So here are the three types of HPV vaccine, and then the type of HPV that they are targeted to. For the Cervix, it can prevent against the HPV 16 and 18. For Gardasil, which is a quadrivalent, it can prevent four types, 6, 11, 16, and 18. But the last one, Gardasil 9, is the latest HPV vaccine, it can prevent nine types of high-risk high HPV. So I put down the, the estimate cost of the vaccine as well, those, for those who are interested. For Cervix, three doses, total about 500 to 600 Malaysian ringgit. For Gardasil, it's about 600 to 700, depends on where you are going to get. For Gardasil 9, it's around about 14,000 to uh, 1,400 to 1,500. Sorry. So in UK, National Immunization Program started in 2008 using the Cervix. And starting from 2012, they changed to Gardasil. So now uh, it's a quadrivalent vaccine. So how about in Malaysia? Starting from 2010, the National HPV Immunization Program started and implemented. And then the HPV vaccine is supplied freely to the, to the girls, which is about 13 years and above. So by the end of 2011, 40 countries have introduced HPV vaccine in the National Immunization Program. So this is the National Immunization Program of the HPV vaccine in Malaysia, start from 2013, targeted to the girls of 13 years old and above. Certainly, it's not for the boys yet. So how effective is the HPV vaccine? HPV vaccines are 99% effective for those who are the sexually naive. But HPV vaccine have not been shown to protect against the disease if the woman have the active HPV infection, active infection. But however, if the woman 
had the HPV infection, which is exposed to the HPV infection, but is no longer infected because of a good immune system, it has already gone away, it can still have the coverage, about 60%, which is obviously lower than the sexually naive individual. So how, was the, how is the HPV vaccine given? So it is given to the other by root of the intravascular injection. Is it safe? Yes, it is a very safe. And safe, safety has been established through a lot of clinical trials. So as like a usual vaccine, there can be a mild and transient reactions and pain and swelling and redness at the site of injection, but it is a very good safety proven. So the last objective is a HPV infection in men and immunization for men or the boys. So is there HPV for men? Sadly, to date, there's no HPV test recommended for men yet. Screening for inner cancer is not routinely done. It's, it's because the more research is needed to find out whether the screening test is really cost effective or not to prevent inner cancer. But however, for, for example, like a bisexual uh, or HPV positive men, and then it was recommended to have the inner pap test every year or for the women, cervical smear. For the penile cancer, also there is no screening test available yet. So how about the boys? Do they need HPV vaccine? Yes, the vaccine can help to prevent the boys from getting the HPV infection. And then, uh, then we can prevent the HPV-related malignancies and genital warts as well. And by giving the vaccination to the male, it can be beneficial for the female partner to reducing the spread of HPV virus. So in that mean, it can prevent the cervical cancer in the partners or the spouse. So in England, both boys and girls aged of 12 to 13 years are routinely offered with the HPV vaccinations, starting from the year eight first dose, and after that, there will be a, after six to 24 months later, there will be a second dose. So when we look at the data, <clears throat> most of the awareness on HPV and then cervical cancer, there are a lot. But our, and then vaccination for the women, also the data are quite a lot. But however, there's limited data on the awareness of HPV related disease in men and availability of HPV vaccine in boy or men. So when we look at the data, the data are, are still very limited and about the whether people have more awareness on the HPV-related disease in the men and whether there is a vaccine against the men or not. So we decided to do a study in our university, first with our medical students, because since they are the future healthcare professionals, so we want to check how about the awareness of our medical student for again for the HPV related disease and vaccine for the men. So we have done the study a few years ago, and um, so with my colleagues, and then uh, Alvin and Susan from our batch of fifteen medical students. So our objective is to evaluate the awareness of medical students or HPV-related disease in men and HPV immunization for men. So how do we do it? We just created the online questionnaire about the HPV and HPV vaccine. And then we send through the either WhatsApp or email to our medical student from year one to year five at that moment. And we aim for 125 participants. So here we have, we have two parts of questionnaire. One is the knowledge part on HPV. Another is a, whether they know about the HPV vaccine, both for men and women. So these are the questions. 
Have you heard of, of, about the human papilloma virus? What are the mode of transmission? Whether those who are infected have the sign and symptoms or not? Who are at risk of HPV infection? Do you think that men can have HPV? Do you know what are the HPV-related diseases in men and what are the HPV-related diseases in women? So second part is uh, about the HPV vaccination. Have you heard about the HPV vaccine generally? Have you heard about the vaccine against cervical cancer or head and neck cancer? Have you been vaccinated against HPV? And if you haven't vaccinated, would you agree to be vaccinated? Or did anyone have, has anyone advise you to get vaccinated with the HPV vaccine? Or have you ever heard of, about the HPV vaccination program in Malaysia? If you have, you known about the HPV vaccination program here, do you think is it for the men or women or both? Or have you heard about the, do you, do you know any HPV vaccination program for men in any part of the world? Or do you think the man needs to be vaccinated against HPV? So these are our questionnaires. So we do the analysis and altogether, starting from year one to year five, we got altogether 132 respondents. So these are the, our demographic data. And then interestingly, our female are 87 and the male participants are 45 because our nature of the medical school as well, the, we have the more female uh, medical students than male. So here are our, our results and conclusion from our study. So majority of our medical students have heard of HPV, but however, there is still a significant lack of the knowledge about the basic facts about HPV infections. So our medical, medical students are the, um, they, um, we consider the medical students that they are, <coughs> they are known to have more knowledge about, about the disease, about the medically related condition than general population. So we found that our study, um, they still need to, um, they still don't know about the, some of the facts about HPV, like how they spread, and then uh, whether they are symptomatic or not, what other uh, HPV related disease or malignancy. So we may think that general population might be <clears throat> the awareness might be lower in the general population. So um, many students, especially the male, they don't recognize that HPV vaccine protect the women from the cervical cancer. And even the fewer medical students realize that it also protect against the other cancer, including head and neck. So in fact, HPV also protect the, uh, the cancer against head and neck, in eye cancer, in the cancer. About uh, nearly 50%, 44.8% of the female students have not been vaccinated against the HPV, despite being the other high-risk population. And sadly, a quarter of our female students are not aware of the program yet. And then male students are significantly less aware than a female student about the purpose of HPV vaccine. And because obviously um, in Malaysia, right, uh, our national immunization program is targeted only to the female. Maybe that's why female, uh, most of the male students are not aware about the HPV vaccine. And in fact, HPV vaccine is offered to men in some countries. And um, maybe in Malaysia, the, 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 the reason is not in case Malaysia is mainly because of the high cost. It's according to this published data. But the good thing is, um, both most of the our male and female students in the study, they are very keen to have the HPV vaccine if it is offered. So we have done the follow-up study together with Prof. Cho from school. Of, uh, we did a school of and Prof Chong, and we did a study in the 
once the data is available, if we have the chance, and we will share the data as well. All right. Um, okay, with that, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kain, for that very educational talk on HPV and HPV vaccine, and also for sharing your research work on HPV virus. So, since we are running behind time, I think uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, please post your questions in the chat box. Currently, there are no questions. It will, uh, Dr. Kain will take the questions at the end of the all the lectures. So we'll now move on to the next topic, headache and migraine in women by Dr. Javid. I would like to welcome Dr. Javid, Senior Lecturer in Surgery, School of Medicine, Taylor, Taylor's University to deliver his lecture. Welcome Dr. Javid. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anita. Thank you for Fujian <clears throat> and all, all the panels to give me the opportunity to share my, my thoughts and, and opinion. Do you have my voice? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, the, the topic of today has been given to me is, um, is a headache. Uh, in a woman, I have uh, make it a little bit changed, make it headache amongst women, uh, like, as I said, Men also have a headache, but not that much. So we, we have, but women have um, a little bit more. So this topic, is, I think it's very important to, to talk today uh, about it. And, um, and coincidentally, while I'm preparing this topic, basically we found that uh, uh, this month of June is it's a headache awareness day. And uh, they will have a lot of publications by the international headache societies. If you want to know more about it, Please visit to their sites and uh, basically you'll understand more about, about the headache. So the, the overview of my talk for today, <clears throat> uh, headache is basically, I think it's one of the disability kind of uh, uh, problems worldwide. So I'm going a little bit talk a lot about the background history of headache. Uh, I will touch on classification of headache, uh, primary headache versus secondary headache, which I spent some time. I think this is really important from physician and clinician point of view, if someone is referring to you, you have to differentiate what's the primary headache and what's the secondary headache. And coming specifically to migraine, and we talk a little bit about the migraine and overview of the migraine. And the preventive measure for the migraine and what's the treatment for acute attack of the migraine, we're going to talk. So we do have 45 minutes for this session. I'll be a little bit fast. So uh, for the sake of time, um, I share with you uh, a slide. If you're looking there, I, I put one link on the chat box here. Uh, can you just please uh, click on the chat box, uh, box and, uh, and probably just a poll. I want to see who my audience is for this, for this talk. Then I can proceed and I just want to just take two, two to three minutes for this talk. I want to see who is my audience is. Then we can, then we can proceed. Uh, if you can please uh, put your uh, click on a, on a on the chat, I'm going to activate the pool. Uh, sorry, yeah. The pool is now going to be activated. Uh, basically, uh, if you look on the screen, uh, basically we do have a variety of, of, of people on the screen. You see, we have a general public, all right? It's increasing medical students, 60%. Uh, general public, 30 so I just want to, 12% we have a surgeon. I just want to know then I can, I can navigate my talks according to this pool. Then we can talk like what group of audience I do have uh, in, this, in this pool. Uh, one more. So we have majority of medical students. Then I, a little bit I can talk about the physiology, neuroanatomy, and, and we, we take it from there. So, so from this pool, a little bit giving a, a Thanks. Anita, do you see the pools on your screen? All right, so, so I think roughly we have ideas. We have the general publics around 40% and medical students, plus we do have a physician. So I just don't want to spend more time on that. Then we, we go and my talk will be much more simpler. I think it will be a much more general public kind of oriented talk. So we're keeping in consideration, uh, if, you, if you're not clear about any term, so I will, I will carry on. So uh, 
if you look into the, the history of headache uh, per se, uh, it's being, the headache is being basically in, in medical field and, and, and with us for the past 10,000 years. Uh, 10,000 years, basically, we do have a headache. The headache remedies exist in traditional uh, medicines and uh, Greece, Egypt, India, Chinese, and Persia, or you can say that Egyptians, Indian, Chinese, and Persian, they are the one basically this treat this uh, uh, diseases for the past 10,000 years. Uh, before Galen, Galen was near anatomist in 2000, basically 2 BC, uh, he was anatomist and philosopher. They classified on those days, uh, headache into three types, uh, something called cephalagia, uh, mainly referring to mild and uh, short-term headaches. Uh, cephalia is a type of chronic headache and severe, and heterocrania, the headache is mainly to remain in one side of, of, of the head. <clears throat> uh, the, the concept of headache is basically, uh, as I said, uh, the person of the one for the past thousand years, they, they, they're treating the headache uh, with a herbal medication and 20 type of uh, headache being uh, uh, treated. And as well as uh, if the, the time passed away nowadays, uh, it's make possible for us to treat precisely uh, the headache itself. I think it's worth to say that uh, 10,000 years back, it's based on National Geographic published. I got one documentation from them. Uh, saying that uh, they found the excavators, they found about eight, 800 skulls, which there was a whole hole on them. Further on, they, they, they discovered that basically all of the holes was from Peru, Peru is not uh, South American countries. Uh, they make a hole inside the, the skull, which is called trephinations. Trephination is removing part of the bone from the skull in order to remove the, the demons. So those people on those days when they got a headache, Go on those days. The concept was they have a demon inside the head and they do a trepanation and they just like take out part of the bone out. And uh, unfortunately, on those days, there was no anesthesia and they have to do this kind of procedure while the patient is awake. So, this was one of the one of the uh, illustration I found it out while the, they're doing a procedure. The illustration they illustrated, and if you look very closely, you can see. The right eyes is a little bit dilated due to, I think, uh, some sort of uh, procedure being done with this one. So how it is done, but nowadays, I think things are changed when we're dealing with that. A little bit about epidemiology of the, the, the headache per se. If you look into literature, almost 60 to 80% of adults, they will have a headache at some point in their life. Lifetime prevalence of headache is almost like 96%. And we're living in this pandemic right now, I think, I probably I'll estimate like 100 persons like will be headache, you know. Every individual will experience headache once in their life. Uh, one to five percent of the headache is it's a secondary headache, secondary to any other causes. I'll spend some time to explain we should not mix between primary headache and secondary headache. And more than 19 first 90 percent of this headache is a primary headache. It's a, it's a non, it's a functional headache. In most of the primary headache are attention headache. And I'll spend some time and make it very clear when we talk about it. Uh, if you look into the epidemiology of migraines, more women than men experience migraine. It's uh, in Europe and North America, you have looked basically 25 from 12 to 25% of women, they'll have a migraine compared to men who have five to 9%. Uh, cluster headache is another type of headache. It's very specified on one side of the head it's a really main kind of headache and just remaining one side, only 1% 1 of the population will have a cluster headache. Migraine will affect almost worldwide 200 million people and approximately 1.4 billion migraine attack each year. So this is a really kind of uh, catastrophic situations uh, uh, that we're facing up. Uh, migraine frequency in women is known to be twice that men during menstrual cycle period and migraine attack are more severe while they'll have a menstrual cycles and the hormone will be uh, one of the culprit. Uh, a study from Istanbul detected that the migraine age among women being the, the, the established 22.2, but some other studies showing that when the age of menarche starts, basically the, the migraine will start with this one. So it's very related to the hormone kind of phenomena. And once they get into menopause, the migraines exactly become the level will drop down. 
what is headache? When you talk about headache, it is an unpleasant sensation in the head, neck, and face. Uh, we do have uh, two types of headache. This is called primary headache, which is a functional headache, which is the commonest one. 90% of them is a primary headache. And the other one is a secondary headache, which is organic pulse, uh, which is less common, like almost five to 10% of the, the patient have a headache secondary to some a lesion in the brain or some systemic or, uh, or some other um, issue, they will have a headache. This is a secondary headache. Uh, when we, when someone's coming to the clinic or when we talk to, 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 to a person's coming to your clinic, you have to evaluate it from this point. You have to sit and take a detailed history of headache. You have to send with the patient, you have to spend some time, you have to ask the relevant question. Uh, on examinations, mainly general examination of the patients and a little bit pay attention to neurological examinations of, of the headache, then you can reach the diagnosis. And of course, you need some complementary investigations which using imaging, using the CT scan and MRI for, uh, to diagnose uh, certain kind of pathology in the head. Of course, you have to follow the criteria of, uh, this is called ICHD, International Classification of Headache, third edition. This is the latest editions. Uh, if you're looking through, go through these criteria, they have almost 65 to 70 type of headache, and they have described it in really huge and detail. Uh, uh, basically, I think if you want to have look detail, you have to go through that classification and you pinpoint. Uh, pri primary headache, uh, uh, we'll talk today on, on attention headache, uh, migraine, cluster headache, and my facial headache. This is, this is the, the commonest one. Apart from that, there's a lot of other primary headaches there, but I think this is the commonest one we can see a lot of patients coming and seeing us in a clinic with this kind of problem. And we have to differentiate it between what sort of headache we call. Secondary headache is, um, I think this is my job as, as a neurosurgeon, basically, uh, most of the patient while they come to my clinic uh, uh, with, with a headache, I think my concern will be there. Either the patient have some lesion in the brain, so you have to rule out intracranial uh, pathology of causes of the headache. Make sure the patient doesn't have a paracranial or Need some sort of vascular issues, uh, issues that also can cause a headache or some sort of systemic disease. So from that regards, I think it's need to be evaluated uh, really correctly. Uh, for those patients who are coming to us specifically, uh, obese uh, and female patients who come with a headache, we're looking for the suspicious, they might have uh, some sort of, uh, they call it idiopathic intracranial hypertension. In spite of the fact, most of the MRI, uh, if you're looking close, look normal, but if you look into this MRI, they have empty sala, they have papillae edema, uh, they have uh, uh, the, the, the optic nerve will be atrophic. If you look into the vein, the vein will be like thrombosed and they will have a lot of abnormalities. So you have to rule out, make sure if someone is coming, we're not targeting all the headache will be a migraine headache. We should rule out secondary headache. So this is my message. I think we should not entitle all the headache will be a migraine. So this is because if you miss once this headache, I think it will be devastating. So we should be evaluate the patient very carefully. Uh, characteristic of second, uh, secondary headache, uh, how does it, does it what, what's the characteristic? Always this is progressive of, of the course. It's not episodic, continuous headache. Uh, symptom will present, uh, persist and the pain uh, select to the anatomical location. If they have a lesion on that location, the pain will be on that side. And some of them, they have side lock headache. Side lock headache is basically the, the, the headache is on that side of the head. And they arise either from intracranial or extracranial pathology. Uh, and physical examination usually will be abnormal. Um, I put one image here uh, for the sake of times, I think you have to go systematically uh, for extracranial cause of headache, you, you have to look for maxillary sinus, all the way go to the pressure above the eye bone. You have to palpate all of them in clockwise, and you'll see if there is any pathology, because most of this pathology will affect uh, intracranial um, headache, because most of them, they are um, interrelated with each other. Uh, characteristic of uh, primary headache, uh, mostly the recurrent attack. Uh, symptoms free between attacks, uh, pain shifting from one side of the, uh, the head to the other side, and mostly physical examination will be normal. Uh, there is no organic cause for this one, exceptions if the medication overuse uh, headache. Uh, if you're taking medication and stop medication, I think they will cause, this is the only exception 
apart from the clinical examination will be normal with this headache. Uh, to ruling out the secondary headaches, uh, the clinician should have uh, suspicions of, uh, while well, they're working out the patients, you have to look uh, which patient we have the suspicions they, if they come with a headache, if someone is coming with a age 50 and above with abnormal neurological examination finding and having an acute onset. So age 50 and above, uh, acute onset, abnormal neurological examination, you have to send it for, for imaging. But there's certain, uh, some kind of headache also looking like migraine, like a post-traumatic or traumatic brain injury headache is also looking like migraine. If someone have a glioma, glioma is like a brain kind of, uh, glioma is a brain uh, lesion, could be benign or could be malignant. They look, uh, they, 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 their episode is looking like a tensions, headache, and some of them is like a microscopic pituitary adenoma they will have like a trigeminal autonomic cephalagia. Uh, uh, so they have a little bit mimic with uh, benign condition, but actually they might have some, uh, some uh, malignant, malignant pathology in there. So anybody with an elevated body mass index and they're obese, you have to have sus suspicion of hydropathic intracranial hypertension. So you have to rule out all these things. Uh, I think it's for us, if someone is coming to clinic to differentiate between these two types of headaches, uh, migraine versus tension headache, they have specific characteristics. Uh, I'll, I'll go first explain the migraine headache and after that we compare with the tension headache. Uh, migraine headache is normally will be one side of the head in one side, it's almost unilateral. Uh, the, the, the characteristic of the pain will be pulsatiling and throbbing pain, it's like uh, the, the pain will jump. Uh, it will be the, uh, the pain intensity will be severe to moderate and the pain uh, normally is shifting from one side to other side. But it's not always uh, the, the rule to unilateral you know, always consider to be a migraine. Some of the literature say that in pediatric and adolescent groups, they will have bilateral, uh, bi bilateral headache. So always one side headache does not mean to be have migraine. And, uh, and other things to be remembered, the, the, the pain itself from four hours to 72 hours, like three days, they have to resolve. And it's accompanied by nausea, the commonest one, and vomiting. And the patient will have, uh, don't like the lights. It's got photophobia and they got photophonia and they're not very uh, good with the noise as well. On other hand, tension headache, they are on both sides. Uh, the severity of the pain is, is not so severe, the small pain. Uh, the characteristic is it's a uh, non pulsatile kind of pain and uh, aggravating factors while they're moving and exercising is not getting uh, aggravated by the exercise or when you're walking up. And usually they don't have a nausea and vomiting. And no, they don't have not more than one episode of photophobia. Uh, so that's the uh, tension headache So to, to understand. Uh, other type of headache we, we talk about is called cluster headache. What is cluster headache? It's very specific to eyeball. Uh, so the headache will be on eyeball. Uh, Lacrimation is coming, uh, mainly it's a parasympathetic nerve getting, getting like stimulated here. And uh, the patient will have tearing coming from the eyes. Uh, the, that side of the face, the nozzle conjection will be there. It's mean the nozzle block or uh, renuria will be some discharge coming from the nose. And if it's a little eyeball will be a little bit like puffy and if it's a little high sweating and uh, the eyes constricted, my eyes are getting constricted and the, the eye uh, eyelid will be dropped down and the patient will be have sense of restlessness and agitation and attack frequency is only every alternative day for eight days. So this is a cluster headache. Mainly it's affecting men, only one person of men will have uh, only one person this uh, kind of headache is affecting and mainly men, it's not very common in females. So this is cluster headache. So we should not put this headache with a, with a migraine, we have to differentiate it. Uh, if you're looking to, I put in for summary the same things, if you're looking to uh, the, this tree all together, location, unilateral, uh, bilateral, and the cluster is behind the eyeball. And uh, if you're looking at the characteristic of the pain itself, it's pulsatiling, migraine is like pulsating kind of throbbing pain. And if you're looking to the tension, it's a dull pain. It's like, you cannot differentiate, it's like continuous dull pain. 
Uh, and uh, on the other hand, on the cluster headache, it's excruciating pain, sharp pain. So you have to do, and the differentiation, the differentiation also uh, is different. The, the time duration is different among all of them. All right, the, the pathophysiology, why this kind of pathologies will come true? What is the pathophysiology of, of this? If you look into the brain itself, the brain parenchyma does not have any uh, sensitive or, or nerve service. From brain parenchyma, there's no uh, pain fibers running through, it's not coming through. There are lack of uh, pain receptors. Uh, and and uh, migraine pain or uh, neurology of migraines, normally there's a few theories there. I'll, I'll just uh, simplify of that theories. One is called neuronal theory. So what's happening from neuronal fiber of meninges because the, the brain is powered by the uh, meninges. Let me go one step. If you look into the brain itself, this is powered by one layer. This is called meninges. Uh, meninges has got three layers. This is called the dura mater. So this meninges uh, sending a signal, uh, the sending fi fiber sending a signal releasing uh, something called CGRP. This is called calcitonin gene uh, uh, related peptide. Uh, related peptide signals. So from there, and this signal is mainly under influence of hypothalamus. There is another area in the brain. So the signal is traveling, going all the way to the trigeminal nerve and the larger vessels and reaching to the trigeminal ganglia. Ganglia is basically the cell body of the nerve sitting in one area. Uh, and, and, and trigeminal nerve is it's a fifth cranial nerve, one of the, the biggest nerve. It's got the motor and sensory. Uh, in the brain, so from the trigeminal ganglion, the fibers going to, through the brain stem, going to the thalamus. Basically, this is a circuit inside the brain stem. So from there, the whole going to basal ganglia, from there, the firing going to the entire brain. So basically, the whole, the whole head is, if it is very severe, the whole head is afraid of fibers. They can get a fires and you can get a pain. Or if it's localized, mainly localized in one side, that side is getting uh, pain due to the firing of fibers. The other theory is a vascular theory. This is called prodromal phase. Normally, when, when the vascular theory is, when the firing first, the vessel getting was a construct followed by second phase was a dilatation. As a result of vascular dilatation, there's a lot of um, uh, neuropeptide or neurotransmitters release, uh, which is muscle cells and histamine, serotonin, and um, bradykinin, all of them. They can cause that inflammation. So the the most accepted theories uh, for the migraine pain is this called trigeminal vasculature theory or uh, trigeminal autonomic uh, autonomic uh, encephalagia. It's uh, trigeminal plus uh, parasympathetic autonomics. It's worked together this, due to their irritation. They can cause what's happening in this uh, theory. The reflex continues from trigeminal nerve, which I said is a fifth cranial nerve, the three branches, V1, V2, and V3, with the outflow of parasympathetic uh, uh, nerve. From the nerve fibers, they release a vasoactive substance, which is called substance P and neurokinin A and calcitonin, this three. As a result of that, it's getting vasodilatation. As a result of vasodilatation, the muscle, platelet, and endothelial, they're getting released. And further on, they're getting causing inflammation inside the brain. This is sterile inflammation. As a result of that, you can get a, get a headache. It depends on the severity and amount of this uh, kind of activation. If the trigger is more, you might get severe. If it's small, uh, less, you might not get a severe headache. Uh, and and uh, as I mentioned, basically all, uh, all the, the, the transmitter of the, the pain along the pain pathway going through all the brains and, and as a result of that you can getting a headache and that was a characteristic of those headaches. So now coming to uh, specifically talking about migraine, what is migraine? And um, basically uh, how many phases have migraine? Migraine in, in, in general, if you're looking, it's got a four phase and this uh, migraine, let's call it migraine syndrome. This is called pro-monetary phase, yeah, pro-dormal phase, yeah, pro-headache phase. In this phase of migraine, normally in general population, how you feel, uh, you will have mental hypothalamic or autonomic syndrome kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, feeling. Uh, either you're feeling you're craving for the food, uh, you're getting thirsty, your mood will be changed. Uh, some people basically, they, they become agitative, uh, restlessness. 
uh, and they, some people getting constipation, some people, they have different kinds of symptoms. Uh, in the next slide, I'll explain it to you. So this is one of, one of the phases, basically. At, at the beginning of the headache, you have that kind of feeling. It's followed by aura phase. Uh, what's aura? Auras, if you look into the textbook in the literature, they're saying that it's neurological disorder or one part of the brain, this is becoming dysfunction or you can feel some sort of funny feeling, uh, uh, funny feeling in, in your head and you cannot explain it. Or if, you, if you're looking literally, auras meaning is depolarization of neuron. The neuron depolarization becomes very slow and you can feel some sort of different feeling in, 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 in your body which the auras, we do have visual aura, you're getting perking of, of, of the light, zigzag kind of color of the light. You might, your visions become like really tunnel visions, or you might temporarily lose a few visions. You, you might get in sensory aura, speech, you cannot speak, or you can speak, basically, you cannot articulate your speak, or do you have uh, brainstem aura and hemiplegic uh, aura? Brainstem aura normally, you feel kind of uh, lethargic, your head will spin. Uh, you get um, tinnitus and some sort of sound on your ears. Uh, you're getting confused. Your GCS level will be dropping down and you're getting double visions. Uh, this is a brainstem aura and hemiplegic auras normally. Uh, with the headache, you're getting weakness. It's mimic of kind of transic ischemic attack. Uh, sometimes it's resolving within 72 hours, but sometimes go more than 72 hours being per week. So following this hour of phase, which all the patient with the headache will not getting hour, only 30% of the patients will getting hour. The rest is not very common. You're getting two headache phase. The headache normally is migration and increase in, in intensity of the headache, and which is associated with the nausea and vomiting. Normally the patient will have uh, nauseated. 80% uh, of patients feeling nauseated, 20% of them will have vomiting and followed by photophobia. You don't like the light and you have the noise also will be affecting you. And after that coming to post -derm, which is called migraine in Hauer, in Gaur. For those people who know what Hengauer mean, I think this is uh, the feeling fatigue after this attack, body ache, dizziness, and sensitive to light. And after that, this cycle will be repeat and become uh, the, the, the repetition of the cycle coming back after 72 hours. If you're looking, the same explanation I give it to you, this is for derm phase. Normally the patients, if appetite will be the craving for the food, uh, they looking very tired and always the yawning and they will become very hypersensitive to light tolerance, to noise and sm smell. And some of the patients basically they lose the tension. And, after that, the hour phase, you don't have headache. In hour phase, is basically just remaining. There's nothing happening in hour phase, and this is a transit. The hour phase is only remaining from 15 to 20 minutes. And after going to headache, and after the resolution, and the cycle will be follow follow accordingly. Uh, accordingly. All right. Uh, mental manifestations at the same. If you're looking so with the mental manifestation, most of the patients looking hyperactive, some of them looking happy, restless, drowsy, irritable. Some people talking more, more. this is kind of hour. And some people have difficulty in concentration. And if you're looking hypothalamic uh, uh, symptoms of hour and, and full dorm, they have yawning, cold feeling, food craving, anorexia, diarrhea, constipation, thirst, and urination. They will urinate more going to this. Uh, typical visual auras, as I mentioned before, basically him one, the, the, the vision becomes tight. Some of the patients getting blind, temporarily blur of vision, nystagmus of the eye, and some of them got ophthalmalgia, okay, mydrosis, dilatation of pupil, and sometimes twisted of the eyes. With with other auras, normally you can feel some sort of prosthesia, but it's not numbness, some sort of feeling uh, funny, funny something is crawling on your skin and the patient will have aphasia, okay? They're not understanding what you talk about or they have dysarthria, they cannot articulate the words or uh, the, the combination of aphasia and uh, um, uh, basically um, dysarthria. And some patients, they might have hemiplegia, which is, they call it basilar artery migraine as well. They, headache and they've got weakness and seizure and some people getting seizure and dizziness. So this is, this is accompanied with a, with a migraine. Uh, 
The same thing again, unilaterals on location, migraine pain, syndromes, my, migration of the pain, and versatility. This is the characteristic of migraine, which I explained it uh, before. Associate sometimes nausea, um, they have dizziness, they have don't like the light and noise will be not there. And something called allodynia. Allodynia is kind of funny feeling of the pain. And this is very true for those patients who have uh, trigeminal neurologia. Even a simple wind crossing on your face, they're getting a severe pain sensation because their nerve, no receptors, receptors of, of the pain becoming extremely, extremely uh, sensitive. While the patient, a small wind or a touch, they'll feel pain. So they'll have, uh, this is a serious symptom. Uh, for migraine, what's the aggravating factors? Uh, we have to be keep into considerations. Uh, of course, uh, dietary factors uh, like important, the patients will be getting yourself hungry. Um, it will be triggered the migraine attacks. So you have to have your food on time. Alcohol, yeah, it's, um, alcohol is one of the, the um, aggravating factors. Additive, I will come a little bit more talk about this one. So if you're putting some color on your fruits and certain fruits, I'm going to talk a little bit more on this one. If you have less sleep or more sleep, and uh, hormonal changes, specifically in women uh, near the period, when you're getting period one or two days to the period, uh, hormonal changes, mainly estrogens, uh, drop down in estrogen level. I think this is the trigger of the, the, the migraine. And environmental factors as well, if they're living in, uh, in high altitude and weather change. What's the relieving factor? Dark environments and quiet environments say to be a relieving factor. I think, I think it's really important to asking the relationship between migraine and nutrition. It's really important. So what kind of food you want to use if you have mig migraine? The most common uh, reported nutrition triggers for migraine is chocolate. Yeah, the chocolate they have phenyl, phenyl -thyl amine. It's one kind of compound in, in the chocolate. It's found to be micro microgenous. Uh, all those food, they have citrus because of octo octopa amine is found in this uh, citrus food. I, I got this from one of the literature, basically they explain. Dietary factors, yogurt and cheese, fat in fry foods, tea, coffee and cola, I think you have to avoid that kind of foods. And artificial sweeteners, uh, they, if they're sweetening something in artificial, this is called aspartam. Uh, they also, they have, uh, they have more saccharose, I think they're one of these microgenes. And alcohol beverages, yeah, they're increasing the histamine, histamine, and those who add on the, some food colors. Uh, because they are the one, the, the trigger, the pain pathway and cause was a construction was dilatation. So food have major role in migraine. If anyone have a migraine, I think you have to look after your food as well. The relationship between migraine and obesity, of course, there is a direct relationship with migraine and obesity. Those people who are obese, they are five times more to getting the child's migraine compared to with the normal BMI people. Uh, the risk is higher. And who someone is even morbidly obese, the chance even 80, 80 times, 80% 80 more than the normal people. So, so if you're if you're overweight, I think you have to do a little bit of lifestyle modification. You have to reduce your weight uh, in order to not uh, getting. The reason for that is basically in migraine, and in migraine the hypothalamic symptoms they increasing the appetite. So you might eat a lot and you have less sleep, and as a result of eating a lot, uh, so you might put on some more weight. So, uh, so obesity have directly related to that, to migraine. So you have to a little bit work. Migraine women, the role of uh, hormones. Yes, uh, hormones, as I mentioned, they, they, have, uh, they have a role. Uh, specifically, those women, when they're getting uh, during menstrual cycles, the first or two days of menstrual cycles, uh, they're getting the attack of migraines will come. Uh, and estrogen is, the level of estrogen, according to some literature, said estrogen level will dropping down. It's the fluctuation, not necessary to be less, not necessary but the fluctuation of the hormones, they're uh, microgenous, you, you, can, you can get. And uh, menarche and decrease, uh, yeah. So, so that, that's, uh, that's the, the main culprit is estrogen. Uh, uh, and, and they're saying that before puberties, yeah, before menarches and after menopause, the woman doesn't have much migraine when they have. So they have a direct relationship between migraine and hormones. Uh, if, you, if you're feeling that way, I think you have to see your either gynecologist uh, for, for, uh, for hormone replacement therapy if it's needed. Uh, so that might change the attack of migraine. 
quality of life and migraine disability amongst women. Um, according to WHO, almost migraine is ranked 19 among all disease causing disabilities. So this is a WHO definitions and 12th leading cause of uh, uh, cause of year leave with disability among females along all age worldwide. So I found one, one literature review when I looked through, uh, it was done by USM in 2015, actually it's Malay version of them. They have done one study in Malaysia. This is, uh, they wanna see what's happening with, within Malaysian women. So using the same WHO uh, criteria and questionnaire that's called MIDAS, it's called Migraine Disability um, uh, Association, uh, Association Attack, Mid MIDAS, they call it. Uh, they, they found that in, in this uh, questionnaires, normally they're giving from zero to 90, 92 numbers uh, and they have translated in Malay. Uh, and, the, the, and they give three domains, uh, how much migraine will affect the, someone is in the workplace, in household work, uh, how much affect. And the finding of this, um, uh, this questionnaires and this study was really, uh, I mean, significant. Uh, so the conclusion of this study was there, migraine have directly impact on quality of life. Those women who have migraines, I think uh, they will have uh, basically a lot of things they cannot carry on, like with a, with a, without those people doesn't have migraines. So they have large impact on quality of life. Um, in, in, in Malaysian women, they have done that study. In this study, it was mimicking worldwide with, with other women as well. Diagnosis of migraines, how are you going to diagnose? Uh, according to International Headache Society classification of headache, the migraine, uh, basically they have certain criteria to, to be diagnosed. And, and if, uh, as I mentioned before, if any patient is coming with a headache, you have to rule out as a clinician the secondary uh, headache and use the, the diagnostic guidelines uh, for them. So uh, what's the guidelines according to international classification of headache? What guidelines are you using? Uh, this is the guideline for migraines uh, without aura. Uh, if they're saying that someone have five attacks per month and the headache is lasting only four to seven, two hours. If, if, treat, if untreated, if you treat it, not, not responding to treatment, and uh, the headache has at least two of the following characteristics. It's supposed to be unilateral. The quality of the pain will be pulsatile pain, and it's have to be severe to moderate. Migraine is not coming exhibit in, in mild form. So always either be moderate and severe. But again, it's very subjective to each individual, the level of you perceiving a pain. You know, some people, the level of tolerance is like very high. So a little bit is subjective, but the pain itself, it's moderate to uh, things. And aggravating by, uh, uh, it's aggravating by causing evidence of routine physical, if you do physical examination, it's getting aggravated and it's accompanied by nausea and vomiting. And it's, uh, it's have one or two episodes of photophobia and you don't like good smell, light and, and noise. It's getting aggravating factors. Uh, a little bit difference in the migraine with the aura, and it's a little bit, the slide is a little bit like crowded. So I just make it, uh, make it simplify. So if those patients who have aura, as I mentioned before, uh, the migraine uh, at least you'll have, uh, consists of at least one of the following uh, attack with, with the migraine. So either you have visual disturbance, but this visual disturbance in, 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 in terms of will be flirking of light, spot of light and zigzag of light, but they should not have loss of vision. Or if the patient have a headache, uh, they will have some sort of sensory symptoms, but like pinprick or needle, but the patient should not have a numbness. Numbness is totally different. If you have some numbness, you have to rule out, uh, rule out some other pathology. At least two of the following will be uh, on and someone have migraine with aura and the patient might lose one side of the region temporarily and you have unilaterally loss of sensory and they will have at least one hour symptoms which less than five minutes. And subsequent to this one, they will get another hour which is lost for more than 60 minutes. And headache not occurring during this hour phase. If you have hour, there will be no headache. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and if you have this kind of symptom, basically I think you should, you should, uh, you should see your clinician. You have to come to the hospitals to, to rule out 
uh, make sure to not missing any secondary headache. The treatment of uh, migraine. I think I think as a clinician, if anyone's coming to your clinic and asking uh, help and seeking help, you have to correctly diagnose and approach uh, appropriate approach to the problems. And proper choice of uh, symptomatic and preventive measure measurements supposed to be given to the patient. And prevention of migraine uh, from progression has to be the goal. And you have to critically, you have to evaluate and you have to follow up the patients coming to, to your clinic. Management of migraines known to be, uh, it's, it's a neurological disorder and it's affecting, as, a, as I said, it's impacting the, the social life of each individual. Um, new approaches being uh, basically stated to the migraine. So what do we do? Uh, I mean, we try not using the medication. First thing is lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification in terms of, you have to, you have to, all these triggers of migraine, you have to take it away from your life. You have to have a healthy food. You have to go to the bed early. If you're smoking, uh, smoking cigarettes, reduce the smoke. If you're drinking alcohol, uh, give, give away alcohol. No coffee, no drink. Uh, your time of sleep will be will be perfect. You have to have a little bit choosy about your selection of the, the food. And if you have any specific problems uh, in regards, and you know that that problem is triggered, you have to treat your those problems. And if you have any chronic illness, uh, because chronic illnesses itself, uh, they can trigger the migraine as well. You have to seek a, seek a uh, medical uh, attention for your chronic illness. Uh, there is a lot of, in the market, if you go, there is a lot of medication for the market uh, given up if from NSAID, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, till you can give uh, to all the specific medications. So uh, this slide is uh, a little bit crowded. So what they recommend, the recommendations for acute treatment of migraine attack, they're saying that oral non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, like you can give uh, brufin, so naproxen, plus, Chapton. Chapton is, is uh, the answer is, is the general medications for, for the headache and chapton is specific to migraine or recommended. Uh, before and taking the NSAID and chapton oral metoclopramide because most of the times the migraine, as I said, they have nausea and vomiting. So they might have vomits and the drug will not help. So you have to have oral metoclopramide is for vomits. Um, recommended in a very severe attack, uh, you have to take salicylic acids and, and followed by uh, uh, Sumatra 10, uh, it's, a, it's a top 10 family. And if the migraine is running more than 72 hours and it's a micro, uh, microgenesis, uh, it's mean the migraine is not resolving within 72 hours, you might use the corticosteroids, but this is not being supported by, uh, by, by a lot of studies. Uh, and they said, secondly, you have to go for dehydroergotamines. This is another specific migraine medication and they have specific role for, for that one. Uh, uh, there's a class of medications in the, in the markets. I'm not going to talk about them. So there are some of them working fast, some of them slow. Most of them margin specific. The Chapton is a, it's a, it's a serotonin uh, agonist kind of medications. What they do, the causing was a constriction. A serotonin um, agonist medication or the other group uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, the cause was a constriction, some of them working fast and some of them working slow because some of these uh, medicines, they can cross the blood brain barrier and some of them, they cannot cross. I mean, they slowly diffuse. So based on that, they're very selectively. So you have to consult your doctor according to your symptoms. They have to giving you uh, the medication. Uh, if you look at the new guidelines, uh, some new medicines also in the market recently come, uh, and from those, they, one of those is basically called mol monoclonals, this is called CGRP, this is called uh, calcitonin gene-related peptide agonist. Uh, uh, what they do, they, they, this medication is basically just approved in 2019, or given by injection, this is mainly in injectable, in injectable forms. They can be used as a therapeutic dose and they can be used as a prophylaxis and, and, and preventive dose as well. Uh, so what they do, the antibodies bind to the um, either calcitonin gene related uh, peptide receptors to, to dilate the vessels. I mean, those vessels are getting dilated to preventing from dilating the vessels. This is one of the effects is anti-inflammatory inside. 
And the second one is they block the transition, the transition of the pain. So it's got two effects uh, of, of this medication. So it's recently published in Nature. Uh, you can find, you can read about it. Uh, always prevention is better than cure. I think if you can prevent migraine, it's, it's better. So uh, prevention, so you have to change lifestyles, practice good sleep hygiene, mean you have to go sleep on times, you have to get up on times, avoid coffee, alcohol, and smoke, avoid to use phone before sleep. Because we have habits, most of the time we go into sleep, we take our phone and iPad, I think you have to put that thing aside. In eight healthy meals around the same time on each day. And your timing of meal will have to be perfect. I think you should not mix, sometimes you have it early, sometimes late, you have to get on time. Get regular exercise. Avoid things that might trigger your migraines because you know your disease really well. So you avoid those things and avoid medication overuse. So don't go over the counter because certain, uh, certain headaches, this is caused by, by medicine as well. So this is called medication overuse uh, headache. So you have to avoid those medicines. Which patient supposed to go for, uh, to take a prophylaxis of migraine? Uh, those, all those patients who do have aura with, uh, with uh, basically either it's a brainstem aura or hemiplegic aura or aura more than 60 minutes, uh, or they might, uh, they might have some serious kind of complications uh, or those patients, they will have frequent attack, two attack for weeks and they have the risk of rebound headache. You know, the headache is coming back. So for those patients, they have to take uh, prophylaxis of migraine. Prophylaxis of migraines, as well as lifestyle, plus you have to take medication before to prevent from the attack to coming. First. Complication of migraines, migraine as, a, as other disease, yes, is half complications. Uh, it's a commonly disabling kind of uh, nervous systems uh, complication will come. Uh, they will, the migraine, if, if the migraine attack like for, for prolonged, they might, the patient might getting infection, they might getting ischemic stroke, that's called migraineous infraction, okay? So it was severely was a constrict the vessels, it might coming landed up with a uh, ischemic stroke, it might getting a seizure. So it's have some serious complication. I think you have to take this uh, disease uh, seriously and try to avoid the complication. In conclusion, basically, I think it's my last slides going to talk. So take home message for those who are listening to today's talk. Uh, and, and for my doctor's colleagues, uh, basically seeing the patient in a clinic, correctly diagnose the pathology and should not miss the secondary headache based on history and clinical examination. Because we saw uh, as a clinical practice, this is the normal time in general publics, they're not coming to doctor, they say it's migraine, migraine. And the doctor also not spending time and they might miss and suddenly say that the huge tumor you find in the head, that will be catastrophic. Always emphasize should be made to not miss the secondary headache. Properly investigate the patients and analyze the pathology, treat the pathology, migraine based on lifestyle modification, modifications, prevention of migraine by prophylaxis and careful use of pharmaceutical agent. Because those migraine specific drug as well, they have very uh, bad uh, kind of complication because was a constriction, certain kind of that medication, you cannot give it more than nine days to 10 days. And uh, you might have cardiovascular, your peripherals and vessels constriction. So you have to be, uh, you have to be careful. And, and we as a clinicians tend to focus on the treatment and frequency of, of migraine and often fail to address the overall functional impairment quality of life of the patient. And I think we have to be a little bit empathic with our patients being there compared to be uh, sympathetic. I think we have to put ourselves because migraine is one of those diseases can cause, uh, I mean, they have severe uh, kind of quality of life uh, disturbance and, and we're trying to uh, help them and help ourselves. I think that was my last slides and, and, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Javid, for that uh, very informative talk on headache and uh, um, migraine. I, I think most of the information you shared uh, is applicable for both the sexes. And uh, you also shared about how to diagnose and uh, treatment and its prevention and complications. I think uh, uh, all of our audience would have uh, got a um, deep insight of uh, your knowledge which was shared today. So. We'll move on to the next speaker, Dr. Joseph, a senior lecturer in psychiatry, School of Medicine, 
Taylor's University to deliver his lecture on how to diagnose autism in a young child. Welcome, Good Dr. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Anita. And uh, am I allowed to share my screen? Uh, yes, doctor. Okay, let me try and put up my slides. Can you see my slides? Uh, no, can't yeah. see, doctor. Okay, one minute, one minute. Maybe I haven't opened it yet. Wait a second. PowerPoint. Now, is it up? Yeah, I can see now. Okay, all right. Thank you. Sorry to keep you waiting. Now, <clears throat> okay, now uh, I'm here to talk about autism spectrum autism spectrum disorders that is more commonly known now. Uh, but of course, I'm going to make this a very casual talk basically to, to uh, help people identify uh, the, the features of uh, autism or what we call the autistic traits. Uh, I'm, trying, I'm going to try not to make it an academic talk. Uh, you know, at, at this hour after listening to two uh, in-depth talks, it might be difficult for me to be too academic, so I will just be quite uh, light and easy and uh, now uh, the term autism came qu quite long back about I think uh, uh, less just less than 100 years ago uh, somebody called Leo Kenner introduced this term autism then the word autism refers to the sense of being alone okay auto alone right not automatic but that's where automatic also came from on alone by itself right so the because these are people who uh, live in their own world uh, that's uh, the old description of autism uh, living in their own world now my my take on that my explanation for that is the these are people uh, the the worst most severe form of autism are people who uh, do not are not aware of other living things Okay, they're only aware of themselves in this whole universe, right? Everything else is furniture to them. Okay, that's the most severe form of autism. Now, what I'm going to show you that it is a spectrum. Uh, autism is not one single disorder. It's a spectrum of disorders. Uh, I'm going to show you that concept, right? Now, Now, the, the term spectrum, of course, you know, we all know what's a spectrum, referring to the rainbow. It's a range of symptoms. Now, in autism, the range of symptoms is very, very big, from mild to more severe. There's a, a few hundred thousand different kind of possible autistic traits or what we can call symptoms. All right. So, you know, having, uh, you cannot diagnose somebody just by looking at all oh, three or four symptoms. Okay. Sometimes one or two symptoms may give you an idea that this person may be autistic. Sometimes you may have 10, 15, 20 symptoms or more. Okay, so that's why it's a spectrum. Uh, so just to go through some of the terminologies. Now it's all, it's uh, this spectrum is known as pervasive development disorders. Okay, now this, it, uh, in the older classification until DSM 4TR, they included, or actually still is, but they said autistic disorder, Asperger's syndrome, Rett's disorder and childhood disintegrative disorder. Now the last two are very rare, okay? So it's not hardly spoken about now, okay? Although I have seen one or two cases of both, uh, but it's very, very rare, okay? Now the, so I'll focus mainly on autis, autistic disorder and Asperger's syndrome, uh, because that is now becoming more and more common. Uh, I can't say extremely common, but becoming more and more common, right? So the, the, now, what do you understand by the term pervasive developmental disorder, right? Now, these are two terms here. One is pervasive. Pervasive means including everything at all times, covering everything, okay? So, it's all-inclusive, 
Uh, in, in this sense, it is all systems, all parts of a person's life is affected, okay, or can be affected, right? Developmental, now that of course is, is I mean, as doctors, everybody will know what is development. Uh, from the time the human being is conceived, right, from conception onwards, there is development taking place. We all know our basic sciences, we, we read about the, the his, what do you call it, the anatomy, how from conception from two, two cells to four cells, 16 cells, it goes on developing and somewhere along the line you get different tissues formed, the three germinal layers and then they divide into different systems, okay, the notochord go on and on dividing into different systems, different organs come up, all right. There is a specific order and timing for this development or this part of growth. Okay, and most of this development takes place in the first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, I have two eminent uh, gynecologists here, so you know the the first trimester. Most of this takes place in the first trimester of pregnancy. Very little takes place after that, and hardly anything takes place after birth. Okay, so the the so this development is which is the root of the problem in autistic spectrum, right? The now, as we know it, as we have studied development, there is a pattern, there is a timing, and all this is based on the, you know, the median of general population. Some people will be slightly off what we think is a median. For example, we say by day 20, you can see the heart beating on the ultrasound, right? Day 20 of fetal life, okay? But not everybody will be on day 20, right? Some may be a day earlier, two days earlier, two days later, right? So that's a developmental difference. Now, these people that we are, or children that we are talking about here, okay, their development, they are the outliers. I mean, they are far away from this median. They are far away from what we call the average, the timing. Not just in timing, but also sometimes in the order, okay. Certain systems that we expect to develop earlier now may come later. Other systems come earlier, okay. So the order, the timing may, be, may differ either earlier, later or in a different, you know, arrangement, okay. So that's you must understand that. Uh, that is the basis of this whole condition. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now, that's a little bit about the, the diagnostic criteria. Now, I'm not a person who pays attention to diagnosis, but, you know, today the world expects us to, to toe that line of making a diagnosis based on a certain number of symptoms. Uh, but I'll just introduce that to you here and mention what I, I, I do in my work. Now, the autistic spectrum is... Uh, characterized in general by three main areas of impairment okay one is the severe pervasive impairment developmental areas like what I told you just now but what you see is the impact reciprocal social interaction okay that is one the social reciprocal social interaction is how we engage with other people how we communicate uh, verbally non-verbally eye signs how we show our hands okay how emotional interaction whether other people can understand this person or whether we can understand other people now this is the reciprocal social interaction a lot of our life is dependent on social interaction okay they say man is a social animal it's part of our human evolution right now that is one area the other area the second area is the abnormal language development speech okay uh, i'll tell you the details of this uh, all these uh, groups i'm talking about abnormal language development and the third one is the stereotypical patterns of behavior, interests, and activities. So these are the three areas which are used for a formal diagnosis, right? Okay, now what I want to tell you that, you know, don't focus on a formal diagnosis. A lot of people slip through the cracks because we look at this formal diagnosis. Autism is not only about these three areas. Uh, that is for the diagnostic purposes, uh, to document. But actually the symptoms are a lot more than that. Okay. Let me just show you a little bit about the prevalence. Now, uh, the prevalence of autism has been, let me, can you see that? Let me give you a bigger one. Okay, this is better, all right? Now, this is, this is of course, from the US, from CDC. Uh, they've gone year by year looking at the development. Uh, the number of cases they identified as having autistic spectrum disorder, starting from the year 2000 all the way till 2012, okay? And you can see here, it started from 1 in 100, uh, 150 and then going all the way down till 1 in 68. So you can see the increase in frequency of incidence in the population in the US. Um, and uh, actually, 
now I think it's a lot more than this. Now, this uh, many countries have done such studies, and they all show similar figures, similar growth in figures, right? Of course, in Malaysia, I don't think we have much studies to go on by. There are a few little studies done, but doesn't say much, right? But so the the you can see the prevalence of autism has increased tremendously. Now, in my work, let me just tell you, I I I my in my clinic, I my. For some reason, my number of cases of autism are very, very high. I'm not qualified in autism. I have no specialized training. You know, it's just because, basically, I think, started off for the fact that I have two autistic children at home. So I people started, you know, the teachers, the school started connecting with me, and then uh, they recommended parents to come and see me. And for that reason, my clinic is now about 70 to 80 percent ASD. Okay? So, the, so I have my own views and opinions about this as well. Okay, now, uh, see, these are the uh, papers that they showed, uh, the, the increase in figures, you can see, but I've changed it to percentage for us to compare more easier, 0 0.66, 0 .7, uh, 0.087 went up slowly until 1.47 in 2012, right, percent. Okay, now that's a Malaysian paper that are published, uh, although it it didn't. You know, it specifically looked at only a very small subpopulation, so it doesn't really reflect the actual numbers. But other studies, small small studies, have been done in Malaysia under different organisations, and but the, the numbers are bigger than this. But in my practice, I know the numbers have shot through the roof. Okay, although no, I don't have a study to show you. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now looking at the spectrum, coming back to the spectrum. Uh, at one end, you have the more severe end, you have the autistic disorder. At the other end, you have Asperger's syndrome. Now, a lot of movies about Asperger's syndrome. Okay, that attracted a lot of attention in the last five or six years. Huh? Even we got a, a Malaysian movie as well, right? Uh, of course, the most famous one being My Name is Khan, right? <laughs> Everybody knows that Hindi movie, All right? Shah Rukh Khan, I think. Yes, Shah Rukh Khan. All right. Uh, now, let me talk about autistic disorder first the more severe end of the spectrum okay now there we have uh, again coming back to the diagnostic criteria marked abnormal development in social interaction as well as communication and restricted repertoire of activities and interests okay what is missing here is language and speech all right in the dsm criteria uh, sorry uh, in autistic disorder the Language and, sorry, not missing, language and speech is a big problem in the social interaction and communication. Okay, now uh, when we move on down to the uh, causes, etiology, although the lot of textbooks still say unknown, okay, now we know that it is genetics. Uh, many family studies, twin studies have actually confirmed its genetics. And even now, they have actually identified the genes. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's uh, 245, chromosome 245, 17, 19 have been identified. Uh, and, and not every child who has autism will have the same abnormalities in genetics. Okay? There are many different combinations. That is why the spectrum is so wide. So it's sort of like a mosaic of genetic expression. Okay? It's very hard for us to look at the DSM criteria and make a diagnosis because otherwise we limit the diagnosis. Now, uh, people call the, uh, we, although it's put down here as causes, these are actually observations or findings that people hypothesized at one time to be the cause. Okay, they found that there were high rates of mental retardation, high rates of seizures, uh, anatomical abnormalities in the brain were identified. EG abnormalities were identified. There was high risk of neurological disorders. There are certain CNS disorders which have been seen more prominently among these children. Okay, and that sort of tells you that it is a biological condition. It is not purely psychological. Okay. And the the some of the other things that were observed were that there were perinatal problems. All right. Now my take on this is these are all findings. Okay, although earlier they considered that these as causes, I think these are all uh, either comorbidities or as, a or as a result of the autistic presentation, okay? Uh, the, the neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, I'm quite sure, is a, is a comorbidity or a complication, right? Now, 
that's come down to impairment in social interaction. I told you I'll give you more details. These are children who develop who have who develop poor relationship with significant others in their life. Okay, from birth itself, they'll have poor attachment to parents. Therefore, maybe poor bonding, uh, poor attachment to other family members, or they may even have abnormal uh, attachment to others. Uh, they may some of a lot of these kids develop attachments not to their parents, but for example, the grandparents or another relative. Or many of these children do not develop any attachments at all, or they have abnormal attachments. Uh, some of them get attached to only non-living things. You know, they treat the non-living thing like a teddy bear. For example, as the parental figure, right? Uh, they lack the social smile. Uh, social smile is one of the milestones we use uh, in, in, in pediatrics to, to look at how the child develops. Now, these children do not develop that. Okay? Uh, abnormal eye contact, you know, a normal conversation, normal interaction with other people, even online like this. I'm actually, when I look at your uh, videos, I'm looking at your eyes, right? That is human eye contact. Okay? When we speak, when we connect with others, we always look into the eyes, right? Now, in these children, this is one of the things that are prominent and easy to identify, okay? You'll see that they cannot do that or they will not do that, okay? When you try to hold the attention and talk to them, they will look either to left or to right while they're talking to you or look down as they talk to you, okay? And if you try to get into the way of your their vision, they will evade your eye contact, okay? Now, then again, there are a few of these children that I have seen who have unusual eye contact. Okay, they talk to me continuously for one hour in consultation without like, moving eye contact. Uh, they are actually staring into my eyes and they can talk monotonously, continue talking for the whole time. Okay, now uh, that is eye contact, reduced attachment, I already told you. Uh, some of them develop, uh, they go to school and develop attachments there. Instead of uh, the family members, they get attached in school. Right. Okay, uh, separation anxiety. All children, all toddlers actually uh, show something called the separation anxiety. That means if you take the child away from its mother or the parents or its usual setting at home and, and, and you know, for the parents leave the child with somebody else, you will see some amount of separation anxiety. All parents would have recognized that when they send their kids to the nursery or to the babysitter or to even to kindergarten, right? You leave the child there, there's a lot of crying and all that going on, especially on the first day, right? This is separation, this is normal separation anxiety which we expect to see in all children, okay? These children may not show the separation anxiety. They may not be bothered that their parent leaves them somewhere and walks off. Okay, may not affect them at all. Or they may have excessive separation anxiety, which is less common. Okay, then they have uh, uh, the failure to make, to play or make friends in school. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer relationships are very poorly developed or do not develop at all, or they're unable to do it. Uh. Sometimes they have social awkwardness, inappropriateness as they grow older. Uh. You expect certain kind of behavior, uh, what we call appropriate behavior, certain things that you can say, certain things you're not supposed to say in certain contexts, in a certain situation. These children never learn to do that. They are not never learned, they're unable to do that. All right? Uh, especially as they grow a bit older into adolescence, they have all kinds of problems. Maybe I can, I can highlight one extreme example from one of my patients here. Uh, this was a boy I started treating when he was in school, I think, uh, he was in year eight or year nine when he became my, my, my parents brought him to see me. He, he, was, uh, he was not classically autistic. He was, I think, he was Asperger's syndrome. I'll describe Asperger's after this. Now, this boy uh, had a lot of difficulty paying attention. Of course, ADHD is very common in autism. But they brought him because of the attention deficit. He was brilliant. He was like a genius, right? But he cannot do his homework. He will not do his assignments. He will not listen to teachers, he will not listen to his parents, he does what he wants. Okay, if he doesn't get what he wants, there will be a big problem. So they brought him to see me uh, and the, the, so with a lot of support, I managed to get him through his exams. Okay, uh, he got into, uh, uh, I think he got into pre-university in one of the, the colleges in Kuala Lumpur and the, of course, the, the, he's more free now, you know, he's not in that regulated school, he's more open and uh, uh, he made, he tried, because because after two years under therapy, he realized that he lacked social interaction. 
So he realized he needed to learn how to interact. So he tried to practice what he learned. He went out, out of his way to make friends now in college. Right? So he tried to talk to people. He tried to socialize, which he never did before. Now, unfortunately, because of the poor social skills, uh, you know, like in his class, one of the, the a group of girls went on a, on a, they went on a holiday, I think, to Port Dixon or somewhere. And there were a lot of pictures. They came back to class and shared their pictures in the sea, on the beach. They were all wearing bikinis. So this guy went up to one of these girls and said, asked her, after seeing all these pictures, he asked her, what do you think about girls who show the uh, camel toe when they wear the bikini? I, I hope all of you know what is camel toe in pictures. It refers to the visible female anatomy through the bikini. Okay, so this guy went up to this girl and directly asked her, you know, and this girl was shocked, you know, the, 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 uh, 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 she was so shocked, she was speechless and, and uh, you know, let, she told her friends about it and her friends uh, took it up with him, especially the male friends in the class. They came and cornered him and asked him, how dare he say something like that? And this guy just didn't understand what the problem was, you know, and they tried to make him apologize. He said, why should I apologize when I've not done anything wrong? You know, I only asked her a question. She can answer the question, <laughs> you know. And finally, they beat him up, you know, his classmates beat him up. And then uh, the next day, the father came into the picture and came to fight with the school, the, the college. And the college made a police report. The girl made a police report and, you know, became very, very uncomfortable. And the father came back to see me and said, what to do? I said, you take a report and show it to the police to squash the case, you know, explaining the problem. And also send a letter to the school to help them to understand that this where the problem came from. Right. So this is social awkwardness. They say the wrong thing and then don't even realize it's wrong. Okay. Inappropriate. Okay. Now, some of them may develop friendship, but their, their interaction is very poor. They cannot read other people's emotions. They cannot express their emotions. They cannot describe their interests. They cannot share their interests. That's some of the common things you'll see in the older textbook will the inability to point. They cannot show you, look at that. You know, they can't show that pointing finger and say, look at that. They cannot share things with others. Uh, this is one of the common findings. Uh, they're unable to share, they're unable to show, unable to point, unable to indicate what they're feeling. Okay, unable to show their interests. Okay. Why do I get a lot of the blank pages? Okay. <clears throat> now, the other one is communication and language. Now, in autistic, when you talk about autistic disorder, this is one of the diagnostic ones. You need to have this to call it the disorder. Okay. The, the speech may be delayed, development of speech may be delayed. Now we ex all expect speech to come between one to one and a half years, okay, to two years. But in these children, they may be delayed up to four or five years, or they may develop, or never develop speech at all. Never develop effective speech at all, or they will develop abnormal speech. Okay, they may just use noises, no words, they just make noises, uh, like baby babbling, or some of them just use clicks, you know, some of the, the you have seen some of the old movies from the, the uh, I think it was in, somewhere in South Africa or something, they had movies showing how the certain uh, tribes or clans in Africa communicate using sounds, clicks. Now, some of these children just use make clicking noises with their tongue, you know, they do that kind of things. And some of them just screech, okay, that's all they can, that's all their way of communicating with the outside world. Or some, those that develop some amount of language sometimes, some amount of words, sometimes use the wrong words or they make their own words. Uh, they make their own language. Some of them have their own language. Okay? So they 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 so language nobody else understands. Okay, and they actually babble in this language. Okay? Thinking that everybody else understands them. Okay? Uh, the stereotype phrases, uh, this is also classically used to diagnose. Stereotype phrases meaning some of these children will actually uh, they go into a party and say and say things like uh, the red butterfly is missing and they will say the same phrase wherever they go it doesn't mean anything to anybody else nobody can understand why the red butterfly is missing but that he has to repeat that sentence okay uh, now because I mentioned that both my children were, were, were autistic one is Asperger's one is not uh, fully autistic. So when I took my autistic child on the, the, the uh, LRT first, uh, sorry, the MRT, when they started the MRT, we went on MRT ride. And you know, he watches all these cartoon programs on TV and all that. One of them was about a bus, cartoon about a bus that can talk, right? So when people get on and get off the bus, the bus says, 
have a nice day. So my son memorized that, although he doesn't speak, he has no speech, all right? But he memorized these lines, and on the train, when somebody got off, got off the MRT, he would say loudly, have a nice day, although he did not, never knew what it meant, okay? So he kept on repeating that throughout the journey, okay? So that's a stereotypical phrase. Huh? Sometimes they have stereotypical words, or sometimes they have sentences, okay? Okay. Uh, still on communication language, 50% of them will not develop useful speech. Okay, uh, Some of them, although they develop speech, they may have very poor comprehension. They cannot understand what others are trying to say. Some of them will have a fascination with numbers or letters. Okay, Certain letters, certain numbers, or some of them only with numbers. They only want to talk about, they only can talk about numbers. Okay. Uh, some of them have developed abnormal body language, not just language, but communication is our body language, right? We use gestures. We all understand this, or we all understand this, or this, right? But these children will have their own body language, which nobody understands. And they do not understand our body language, okay? <clears throat> okay. Okay, now, now the other one is a stereotypical behavior. Okay, uh, normal play of course will be absent. The way they play with their toys will be unusual. Uh, no imagination, no creativity. They may be very, very rigid. For example, when they when they, when they use their blocks, they only do it. In a, they do not, you know, a lot of children build things with blocks, right? But these children may do things like lining up, okay, lining up the blocks or following the color, or following the shape, you know, things that other children will not do, okay. Uh, the uh, and of course, they also have ritualistic or compulsive phenomena, almost like OCD, but here it's very, very specific. Okay, they spin things. I, and because of this increase in number of children who liked spinning things, they came up with a toy called what spinners, right? Okay, that means you give them anything, a pencil, uh, a ruler, uh, you give them a spoon, they would sp have to spin it. They put it on the any surface and they will spin it. You give them a coin, they will wonderfully spin the coin on its axis, right? Okay, many of them do that. In fact, all of them are very preoccupied with spinning or rotating. Okay, not just spinning objects, but rotating themselves. They need that uh, stimulation of their, their, their sensation. They need to spin. They need that. Uh, some of them require to find it very, fa very, very fascinating to sit on the swing and swing. They can't stop. They must do that. Okay, uh, some of them line up objects as i mentioned earlier and i also mentioned attachment to inanimate objects right you know long ago there was a cartoon i think it was in snoopy there was one of the characters that was attached to his blanket so he went everywhere with his blanket there was a child i think yes there was a child who went everywhere holding on to his blanket couldn't be separated from his blanket okay now other interesting things are hand flapping finger tapping now hand flapping is almost diagnostic if you see it it cannot be anything else Okay, hand flapping is this. They do this when they are when they are emotionally triggered, either anger, excitement, happiness, joy. They start doing this and this, or sometimes it's the whole arm. Okay, or maybe even the whole body goes into some kind of rocking motion. Okay, finger tapping is this. Okay, they do certain things, and many of them actually do this, which I never understood why. Okay, they have this kind of gesture. You know, we think it's some rocks and nothing, but they actually it's as if they are communicating with their own hand. Okay. So the, <clears throat> the other one is resistant to transition and change. As I said, they are inflexible. They need to strict routines. They cannot accept change. For example, if you are taking them to school, uh, you go from this road to from road A, you turn to road B, and then you go to school. But for some reason today, they have blocked off road A. So you have to, road, you have to use road D to get to road B. And this is unacceptable to this child. Okay, he will throw a temper tantrum. Okay, temper tantrum to the ex to the extent they may become aggressive because you went a different way. Okay, now a lot of children, if you say we are going out for dinner, and then for some reason say you are unable to take him for dinner today, they say no, today we can't go. We have to change the plan. They cannot accept a change of plan. They will throw themselves on the floor, kick objects. You know, they will toss around. This is a typical you see in all those cartoon children throwing themselves on the floor. This is what it is. This is a temper tantrum. Okay, now these temper tantrums sometimes even persist into adulthood in different forms.
okay i will talk about the adult part when i finish this huh? so the the that is uh, temper tantrums is part of the behavior and they cannot accept a change if things they, if they don't get what they want they will throw a temper tantrum of to some extent some of them will just sulk the milder ones will just sulk you know and have to not talk to you for a while or not do anything with you for a while okay but the more severe ones will actually may even turn aggressive uh, i've seen a few autistic children who are too aggressive as they grew older they became too aggressive for the parents to manage uh, i keep getting these blank pages on my slides okay never mind all right <clears throat> mood changes are also common mood instability all right uh, they may start laughing for no reason or start crying for no reason we think there are no reason but there's something going on inside their mind that is making them laugh or cry okay they cannot control that right now some of these children not some many of these children those with autistic disorder many of them will also have uh, depression clinical depression those in aspergers many of them or i i think most of them have some kind of uh, anxiety disorder right so the the uh, so those are the mood changes to even to the extent of of uh, what we call clinical conditions right the response to sensory stimuli now Many of this patient, uh, say patient, sorry, children, okay, uh, uh, can be under responsive to sensory stimuli. Under responsive meaning, for example, there was one child uh, which I saw in Penang. You can go up to him behind him and put your hand on his back. He wouldn't know you're there. His back, his back is totally. He cannot, can he cannot? He doesn't even realize there's somebody touching him, right? Now it may be the whole body. in some children is specific parts of the body okay uh, the other one is over responsive to stimuli okay uh, sensory stimuli for example uh, many of these children you they will not let you touch their skin around the neck the scalp the ear okay mainly this part other parts of the body too okay oral mucosa is very sensitive most of them cannot brush their teeth because you know the uh, what we consider toothbrush So there will be like a car wash going into the mouth because of over stimulation, right? So they refuse to brush their teeth. So because of this, this was recognized long back. The uh, you know they developed, they came out with uh, toothbrushes for autistic children that did not have bristles but had rubber knobs. And as the child grew, you increase the number of knobs on the brush. Okay, maybe initially only uh, five or ten knobs. As the child grows up. You increase that from 10 to 20 knobs, then later to 15 to 30 knobs, and then eventually end up with a brush. Okay, so you can call it in a sense desensitization. Uh, it has worked for many of these children. In fact, commercially these brushless brushes are available. Unfortunately, not in Malaysia. You can go south of the border to Singapore and buy all this. Okay, uh, I already mentioned the behavior of temper tantrums, aggressiveness. Some of them become self injurious. Okay, they hurt themselves, not because of intend to hurt themselves because they are expressing their frustration i've seen many of these children peel their skin off and they are frustrated or scratch themselves especially when they are anxious okay uh, some of them use sharp objects to cut themselves okay this may not be again like i said not uh, suicidal in intent like we think but it's because they want to feel the sensation they need sensory input because they cannot feel anything so they want to feel that to know that they exist okay now it when i talk about sensory it's not just about touch but it's also to sound to light you know they are very sensitive or not sensitive some of them cannot tolerate bright light cannot some of them cannot tolerate high frequency noises okay some of them cannot tolerate a particular color of light like you know the in between your you know we have your white light and the yellow light in our bulbs okay some of them have got specific difficulties with some color or other and they will keep on off putting off those lights if they cannot tolerate that light okay now some of these children have got either avoidance or a preoccupation for a specific color not just light okay uh, earlier they said all these children cannot tolerate the color yellow okay there was an earlier finding but now we don't say now we say they may not tolerate yellow certain children are looking for the color yellow Okay, it's not just yellow now. Now we know it can be any color, right? <clears throat> As I mentioned, ADHD symptoms. ADHD, fifty percent of children on the on the autistic spectrum, 
will have ADHD. Okay. Uh, earlier it was thought as a separate, all this while, not earlier, all this while it's been thought as a separate condition, but I see it as part of the spectrum. <clears throat> now, uh, now, these physical conditions are generally not included in your diagnostic criteria. Okay? Uh, they always talk about social, communication and, and, and behavior, but physical conditions are not accounted for. Right? Now, these, these children, you know, development is not limited to just your communication, social and behavior. Your development is the entire body. Right? As I mentioned in the beginning, what is development? That's why I introduced from there. Right? The, the, now, a lot of these children have dental abnormalities one common one is uh, indeciduate teeth it's not written in any book but i find so many of these children with this common problem their milk teeth do not fall off they remained okay even when the the even when the permanent teeth is coming out the milk teeth stay there and the permanent teeth has to find a separate space in the oral cavity to come out to erupt elsewhere sideways horizontally Okay, behind, all right. I've seen lots of this, all right. And the milk teeth is very hard to remove that milk tooth. The I don't know what they call it in dental terms. The attachment of the root to the gums is so firm and adherent. Okay, even when it starts, when the milk tooth starts shaking, you know, we all see our children. The milk tooth starts shaking at some point, and it's always going to fall off. It will never fall off. Okay, even the dentist struggles to take it off. I know dentists who have just given up and said, let's wait for it to fall. You know, like a classic example is my son. All right. He, after taking him to the dentist, the dentist tried very hard, of course, very hard to keep him sitting in the dental chair. Uh, they tried all kinds of anesthesia, never put him down to sleep. So finally they gave up. I took him home. And because his preoccupation with the loose tooth was bothering him, he kept on shaking and shaking and shaking it for a few days. Now one day he came to me and showed me the tooth in his hand. Right, where the dentist even couldn't remove it. Okay, so uh, this is a if the child has indeciduate teeth, it will be a persistent problem for all the teeth. Okay, so that's a dental. I'm sure there are other dental things that dental problems which I'm not aware of. Okay, now the other one is GIT. GIT is a very big, it's a separate chapter in autism uh, because the lot of development affects the GIT. Uh, stomach, a lot of the children have uh, reflux. From babies, the children have reflux, unable to keep their food down, uh, or uh, reflux esophagitis. Uh, some of them have persistent burping for whatever reason, right? Then many of them will have uh, constipation, unexplainable diarrhea without any infection. Now, one thing that is clearly known is that many of these children don't develop their normal gut flora. The development of normal gut flora is part of our human development, okay? But some of these women developed abnormally, so their gut flora is different or not developed properly. So when your gut flora is abnormal, then your digestion is different, okay? Now, going here again, it ties up with human evolution. Now, <clears throat> many of these children are lactose intolerant. Many of them are gluten intolerant. This is well known. Now, you know, a lot of companies are making money from producing, uh, what do you call it, gluten-free products. Gluten-free bread, gluten-free cakes, you got cafes, gluten-free cafes, okay? But actually it's because the number of people who have autism have increased, all right? Now the, the uh, not just uh, lactose and gluten, I also find, although not documented anywhere, a lot of them will not tolerate or will not eat uh, leafy greens. Or many of us also, you know, <laughs> have children who don't eat leafy green. But I find the prevalence is higher among this group of children. Okay, I think it's because leafy greens is not part of our human diet. Our original human ancestors did not drink milk. We only st we stopped drinking milk at six months. We cannot digest milk after six months naturally. We need, you know, the external bacteria to help us to do that afterwards, which we trained ourselves to do. Okay, uh, for some reason we cannot. I think we couldn't. We did not eat wheat, right? And of course, we did not leave, eat green leafy vegetables. The early diet of our ancestors, our ancestor meaning from the time we came down from the trees, was uh, shoots, fruits, roots, and seeds. Okay, no leaf, right? Uh, and of course, meat on all came later. All right? 
So there are a lot of these kids because of these abnormalities, many people have hypothesized, not only hypothesized, brought it to the level of writing books, saying they can cure autism by fixing the gut flora. There's a lot of research going on, on gut flora and an autism. Yes, definitely there's a, some association, but whether it's a cause or an effect is not definitely known. Many people are, have decided that it's a, a, a cause and they're going on uh, making money, selling treatments. Huh? Now, <clears throat> uh, a lot of respiratory problems, things like asthma. A lot of these children have asthma. And it's all part of development, right? The lung doesn't develop appropriately or adequately at the time of birth. Okay, uh, ENT problems are very common. A lot of them have uh, hearing problems. A lot of them have adenoid and tonsil problems, very common. Okay, uh, and also I didn't mention eye. Uh, there are some specific color vision defects seen in autistic children. Uh, this I, I knew. I knew that uh, these children have physical problems. A few years back. Uh, I had referred one of these children who had difficulty reading in school. So I told the mother, you know, it may be related to autism, but let me refer him to my friend who's an eye, eye surgeon. And uh, uh, luckily for me, my, this friend of this eye surgeon of mine knew a little bit of autism. He called me back and said, this child has a typical autistic visual defect of color vision. He mentioned the name at that time. I can't remember what it was, you know. So he said, this is definitely only seen in autistic children. You know, so it's very, very interesting, right? Skin. Skin is, we all say the skin is a mirror of our mind or, or shows what we are thinking about or what we are feeling. Uh, in autistic children, many of them have eczema. In fact, that's one of my diagnostic features that I use. When I see, you know, children with some traits of autism, I always look for eczema. And about 95% of my patients or parents say, yes, he has eczema. Okay. Uh, why we don't know maybe it's because their frustration of not being able to express themselves you see severe eczema uh, very often it's under the foot around the ankle interdigital between the toes okay and also in other parts of the body but mostly on the feet, ankles and the feet don't know why huh? okay <clears throat> now when you talk about autistic disorder we also must mention know that the large number of them have mental retardation Okay, 70% will have mental retardation. But despite the mental retardation, uh, people with mental retardation will have certain areas that they are very good at. These are the, what we call the geniuses. Or in the earlier, under the diagnostic criteria, they had the Savant syndrome. Okay, that means they are very poorly developed in everything else except in one area, for example, in maths. They cannot behave themselves, they cannot communicate with people, they are very good in maths or they may be very good in art, okay, or very good in art or even uh, music, right, uh, art, music, you know, in fact, your, some of your most famous people in the world are actually autistic, right, I think I have, uh, yes, I have some names here, the, the list of names are very, very long, I have a very long list of famous people, Einstein, Newton, Darwin, okay, Mozart, Beethoven, Thomas Jefferson, President of the U.S. and another president of the U.S. was also autistic. I forget which one it is, right? So they were. They all had autistic features, okay? Prominent autistic features. To be, I mean, those days people didn't know what was autism. Now we know, right? Uh, so the the lot of our famous musicians, composers, uh, you know, even among my patients, I have children who are geniuses in maths. I had one guy who was mathematically genius, but he cannot do anything with his life. Okay, but he was not autistic, he was Asperger's. Huh? So he, he, you know, he refused to do anything with his life. He just gave up on everything. He finished his school. He was a top student in school. Uh, when he finished his school, that's it. He just didn't study anymore. Then he started turning inside. He developed depression and all kinds of anxiety disorders. Okay, nobody understood him. Okay, and uh, when I got to see him, eventually I made the diagnosis of autism with ADHD and the uh, Asperger's with ADHD and uh, had a, he developed a good relationship with me. He was what, 20, 19, 20, 21 by that time. And uh, so I tried to encourage him to, to focus and study. I put him on medicine to help him study. Uh, he asked me, what's the point of studying? You know, so, you know, it's very difficult to answer their questions. 
you know, what's the point of studying? I'm not going to get, get a great job anyway because people don't like me. Yes, people didn't like me him because of his poor social skills. He's, he talks like this. You know, he's very open, very frank. He annoys, angers everybody. So he stays away from people, right? So they, uh, so finally, I encourage him to study. I say, what do you want to study? He say, I'd like to study maths. I say, okay, maths. Then you look for a course to do in maths because you did very well in school. You'll definitely get a place to do in do maths. So he said, but I don't want to do the degree. Then what do you want to do? He said, I'm ready to do PhD. I'm already crossed the master's level. I already know everything at the master's level. So I don't want to study PhD degree and I don't want to study master's. I want to do PhD. Because, and that was right, you know, when I spoke to others, they said, yes, his knowledge in mathematics is very, very high. Okay, but he's not willing to follow the norm. He wants things his way, so, he, you know, <laughs> has a problem. I actually contacted my friends in UM and they allowed him to join the degree program without having to sit in class. Okay, they, they understood, you know, they say, yes, you're right. Let him sit at home and we'll let him do the course, but even that he failed. All right, now, treatment, the aim of treatment in autism, I won't go into the details, but it's basically, these are principles, huh? to improve the acceptable behavior, socially acceptable behavior, to decrease odd behavior, to improve verbal, non-verbal communication. Okay, now, now to, this is to, to remove the obstacles in their life so that they can function, so that they can integrate with society, so that they can go into mainstream school. Okay, that's what the whole purpose of this is that. You can't cure autism. Although there are many people making money telling, them, telling you they can cure autism, you can't cure. It's a genetic problem. Okay, unless you're going to do some gene splicing, I don't think you can remove the autism from a person. Okay, but your stem cell therapy seems to have shown some Recently, stem cell therapy seems to have shown some benefit. Not enough for me to label it down as a treatment, but that's one possibility. Okay, now, of course, the treatment is multidisciplinary. There's no one specific treatment for any one child. It includes starting from the patient's involvement, the parents, other family members, teachers. Okay, if they're going to regular school, the teachers in the school, or if they're going to special needs school, the teachers in the special needs school all must be included in the treatment team. Okay, special educators. Now, not just that, you have your OT, your speech therapist, your physiotherapist. All these people are part of the treatment team. When I see a patient with, which I think, which, when I make a diagnosis of autism, or I see autistic traits, I will ask permission from the parents to connect with the teachers. Because teachers can give a lot of uh, information to confirm the diagnosis, not just from the parents. Well, teachers see them a great part of the day in school and I also include the teacher in the treatment plan. I mean, what plan I make for treatment, I will inform the teacher. So I'll, I'll, I'll get the teacher to do some of that work in school. Okay, then if there are already OT and physiotherapists, I may need to refer or psychologists and all the list of various doctors, right? ENT, dentist, okay, physicians. Okay, to the, according to the problems that the particular child has or dermatologist, right? So this is the general principle of treatment, all right? So you cannot cure it, but you can help the child cope with his difficulties, his disabilities, okay? Don't look at it as a disease. It's not a disease. It is a way that human being has developed, but it gives them some difficulty coping with the rest of the world, coping with the rest of us. So we help them overcome these obstacles. So I tell all these parents, don't think of the, di forget the diagnosis, forget the label. That's medical. We don't need that. You don't need it. The child doesn't need it. What you need is to identify their traits, autistic traits. If they cannot study in class, we've got to help them study. If they cannot communicate with people, we've got to find a way to help them to communicate. Okay? And of course, a lot of the treatment has to be done early. If you catch it late, it's not very effective. You've got to start very early, early. The earlier you identify it, the better. Okay? Now, Asperger's, I'll be very quick with Asperger's because uh, Asperger's is basically part of the spectrum, the same symptoms, uh, characterized by impairment of social interaction, behavioral issues. But notice the third one no problems in language or communication. Okay? No mental retardation. Okay, that's how it sets 
helps you to decide whether it's Asperger's or autistic disorder. Right, the third one. Okay. Now the the uh, uh, the despite this diagnostic criteria, I will tell you that as people with Asperger's have problems in communication. All right. I disagree with this, and a lot of other uh, people working with autism also disagree with this. They have some kind of maybe things that are not so obvious, not so easy identified, but they do. Maybe I'll tell you some what some of them are as we go along. Okay. Now, Asperger's, they will have abnormal non-verbal communication, uh, not able to recognize like uh, gestures, postures, okay, not able to understand, read other people's emotions. When the other person is angry, they don't know that the person is angry and they go on trying to pester the person even more, okay. Cannot develop peer relationship, I recovered that, lack of social emotional reciprocity. Uh, cannot express pleasure in other people's happiness, this is also seen in autistic disorder, right, we discuss all of that. Then the pattern, patterns and patterns of behavior is all the same. Uh, more in this in Asperger's children, they have more difficulty in these areas. Okay, they need a routine. They cannot accept change. Uh, motor milestones may be delayed, but they will not have what we call the typical mental retardation. Will not be seen. In fact, most of them are very very intelligent, more intelligent. Okay, so many of them or most of them, their IQ is higher than normal. Right. Uh, some of these children with Asperger's will show you motor clumsiness, uh, poor motor development, motor skills, fine motor, gross motor. Some of them cannot, will not learn how to use the staircase. You got to teach them how to use a staircase. You got to teach them how to use a swing. Okay. You got to teach them how to throw something, how to catch something. Okay. So all that requires a lot of physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Okay. And a lot of these Asperger's children are extremely verbal. They are very talkative, they are very mature, you know, a lot of the my Asperger's children that I see, they are maybe 10, 12 years old, but they talk to me like they are 19 years old. They will sit down and after a while, you know, when they come with the parents, bring them in, after a while they say, they will tell the parents, do you mind, this is my session, could you leave the room? I had two or three of my, these children tell the parents to leave the room because they want to talk to me, right? So they, 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 they are extremely mature, extremely independent in that sense. Okay, and they can talk. They will. And their topic of conversation will be very adult. They'll talk about politics, economics, all right, and they'll start talking straight away. They have no inhibition. They do not have that social inhibition. You know, you see a child of that age, they come in, they will not talk to you, right? Or they hide behind the parents. No, these children do not have that. They ask the parent to leave and they start talking politics and economics and, doctor, what do you think about this world affairs now? You know, that sort of, you know, at 10 years and 12 years, they talk like that, okay? And you, they talk excessively. They want to keep talking and talking. And that's one of my di diagnostics. Sometimes when they open the door, the child starts talking to me straight away and I already know what <laughs> possible diagnosis could be. Okay? So that's uh, the Asperger's and their talkativeness and their highly developed uh, mental abilities. Right? Now, treatment for Asperger's basically the same. Promote social behavior and peer relationships. Again, multimodal and then treating the specific traits that we see, okay? Now, as I mentioned, many of these children not only really have disabilities, they have strengths. So part of the treatment is to identify what they are good at, what they are strong with. Is it art? Is it music? Is it mathematics? Is it stage? Okay? Is it public speaking? Identify what they are good at with the parents and help them promote that. Okay? At the same time, uh, trying to diffuse or reduce the so-called disabilities or their weakness. The area of weaknesses, we do something about it. We also identify the area of strength, okay, and encourage that. So these are the main things about autistic spectrum disorder. I didn't go into the academics because I, I thought basically what you need to understand how to identify, to understand autism, okay, because there's been a lot of misconception that it is a disease. It is not a disease, it is not a medical condition, it is not a psychiatric condition. Early on, it was classified under pediatrics because it is seen in children. So, I mean, you see it, actually you can see it from, I can diagnose from, I think even six months to one year, sometimes I can make out, okay. But the, the, the diagnosis in your DSM, they say you can diagnose at three years, okay. But recently, I made a straight immediate diagnosis of a child was two years plus, okay, prominent uh, symptoms. 
okay the child is not aware of his parents not aware of me in the room okay and having uh, hyper uh, hyperactivity attention deficit hyperactivity so it's the diagnosis is very simple okay uh, but your your dsm criteria and most textbooks will say diagnosis is possible at 3 years uh, treatment should start soon after that diagnosis if you miss the 5 year mark it becomes more difficult okay uh, if you can start all this intensive kind of so called therapy before the age of 5 it will help the child okay after that the child has already set in a certain pattern and may be difficult to change especially language uh, speech therapists usually want the child to come before the age of 5 after the age of 5 they will tell you straight off it's difficult okay but they do it does help even if it's after five. i know that huh? i know a lot of these kids who did not speak after that even though diagnosis was late you know in our country the the identification is late a lot of these kids are identified as slow bad children naughty children even till now huh? we know what is autism but still a lot of these parents come to me at 10 a lot of these children come to me when they are going from secondary school to university uh, where they cannot cope with the social interaction and they cannot cope with the level of study the attention deficit they end up coming to see me okay but they but when you take a history you realize they had problems from very very small and it was just deemed a slow child or whatever and left as it was okay i even see adults uh, coming with autistic traits but they come because other they come with mood disorders either depression or anxiety they come with uh, unable to function at work you know now they gone say they i see a few of these people who have been promoted because they are very good brilliant very uh, 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 dynamic when they are promoted the amount of work increase they cannot sit and finish the work okay then they start getting warning letters all this while they are top performers and suddenly because of the level of work increase they started getting warning letters because they cannot sit and finish a task because of attention deficit so they come to me for the first time i'll give a very nice example to illustrate that huh? uh this guy was a ceo of one of the big private companies okay and then he was promoted to a bigger de- section and all that and uh, <clears throat> he came he spoke to me you know like he's like he's some big shot you know executive yes he was a big shot executive uh you know then but i couldn't understand a lot of the things he said i had to keep asking him could you say that again i didn't understand what he meant the context of the way he spoke was difficult for me to comprehend he had all the right words he had all he had the language okay but the way he put the sentences together to express his thoughts was difficult for me to follow and i had to keep asking him what did you mean what did you mean and he has to clarify and he found it so difficult to explain what he meant you know uh, then eventually you know so i realized that some other problem here is not just uh, you know he cannot function at work there's something more in depth to it then he admitted to me people don't understand him you know uh, and he said i find it very difficult to mix with people but because my job i have to mix so i go and give a talk no problem but uh, so i now i now i play golf you know i say wow fantastic you know by by time i already had this notion this guy had autistic features i say you play golf very good uh, so i stim uh, asked him a little bit about golf i don't know much about golf so i asked him a little bit tell me about golf i said who do you play with he said i play alone <laughs> he's been playing golf for 3 years i play alone i don't play with anybody <laughs> so that's class that was classical eh? that, uh, to me that's diagnostic <laughs> and he didn't understand that there was something wrong with that answer i play alone i don't play with anybody so <laughs> okay so that's that's uh, the the i see a lot of this in adults eh? now now they have classified they have accepted that there's adhd in adults and autism in adults what happened to these kids with all the development issues the development will go on and on you know as they grow on the problems will carry on now large number of these children with autistic traits their autistic traits may mellow down may become less as they grow older into adolescence into adults you may not see the traits anymore okay but some of these children persist with their traits and they are the ones with all the other problems the other ones who get into trouble with people get into trouble with the law recently i think you had some uh, teenager or uh, young adult who was arrested by the police because he uh, made some inappropriate gesture or remark or did something to a lady who was standing at the bus stop or something like that okay and he was with his parents and the police put, arrested him put him in handcuff and put him in the lockup okay he was he was known he was a known autistic child right 
and then and the parents came to me and I had to write a report to the police and all that to release him, right? The, the, so many cases like that, okay? So the, the, the problem comes in the social interaction that leads them into trouble. Okay, so we need to identify early so that we can find a way for them to survive in our society. All this while they have been kept outside society, either locked up at home or locked up in some home. No, many of them are geniuses. Imagine people like Einstein and Newton if they were locked away. Einstein was kicked out of school. Okay, Einstein was kicked out of school because he had ADHD. He wasn't studying anything, he never did any homework and he never came to school. He was always missing. Right? They kicked him out of school. Okay? So you all watch the movie Einstein, isn't it, recently on TV? <laughs> okay, are there any things that you feel I have not covered properly? You can bring it up later in the question and answer. But uh, Now this emblem, I think it was there in the beginning of my, my, slide, my show as well, showing you a jigsaw puzzle. It's actually a jigsaw puzzle. It's a bit modified. It's actually a piece from a jigsaw puzzle which is used as the emblem for autism. Okay, to fit into society. Okay, so the, the, that's what is used internationally and the color of autism is blue. Just so that you know. Uh, where you see autism awareness, you'll see you see a blue background and you'll see the jigsaw piece. All right. Thanks, Dr. Joseph, for that very interesting presentation. After listening to your lecture, uh, I presume all of us will have some traits of uh, autism spectrum disorder. So all th also thank you for uh, sharing uh, your clinical and personal experience on this autism spectrum disorder and how to diagnose and treat them at the earliest by improving the social interaction. And uh, it's also interesting when you shared uh, about uh, the movie, um, I Am Con, uh, that is for As Asperger's syndrome. I'm sure uh, most of us will uh, understand uh, further if they watch this movie. Uh, some of them might have already watched this movie. I'm sure uh, we'll get uh, more information and we'll understand better when we watch that movie, including me. And uh, now uh, we, are, uh, clo are we are close to the Q&A session. There are some uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, I'm sure uh, our uh, uh, speakers are ready to take the questions. The first question is for uh, Dr. Javid. It's uh, by Dr. Shubash. Classical migraine and common migraine, is there any difference in pathophysiology and our management? It's for uh, Dr. Javid. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I got, I got the question. Thank you. The, the classical migraine, I think it's old terminology used basically if migraine with aura, that's called classical migraine. So, so, uh, the pathophysiology of all the migraine are the same, and and, and mainly what's happening with the with the aura, uh, they slowing, uh, the slowing the connection of the nerve, the the connection in depolarization of of the neck the, amongst the neurons, the the connection becomes slow compared to in, in normal position. So that's why the patients getting like you know they become in the response they become very very slow. Uh, the pathophysiology we see is still the same. It's not much more different. The pathophysiology of migraine, of all, this is neurovascular kind of irritation. And mainly the nerve is involved with is a trigeminal nerve, which is fifth cranial nerve. Uh, as a result of nerve, and there's a lot of neuropeptide in the brain with, with, with the pain. And, and mainly the, the firing is coming from hypothalamus. Uh, hypothalamus is another culprit trait basically involved. If the all of them coming, it's not one, um, basically, uh, one level triggers. It's like, uh, if you're getting from peripheries, all the senses from the food, I mean, all this kind of triggers, um, migrants triggers coming, uh, and they're coming in the common places. And the main thing is this inflammation of the uh, neurovascular bundle and, and meninges of the brain. Once the meninges are getting inflamed, uh, that's why they're getting a pain on that area. So it's the pain which is if the, the manager is getting like more pain, the uh, more irritations, the pain will be much more intense and, and severe. So uh, classical migraine meaning is migraine with aura. And only all the patients not will having aura, only 30% of the patient, uh, those coming, they'll have aura. 70% of, of them, they don't have aura. 
I hope I hope I answer Dr. Patel's uh, question. Thank you, Dr. Javid, for your comments. Oh, there is another question for uh, Dr. Joseph. Is it possible to differentiate clinically between fragile X syndrome and autism? Dr. Joseph? I think we lost contact with Dr. Joseph. Anybody in the audience can give an idea? If not, maybe we can go to the next question. I think uh, there will be some clinical features like uh, macro orchidism. That is a, uh, I have macro testers will say. Uh, that's the only thing I can uh, recollect from an obstetric point of view. They will have a large testers with the uh, uh, intestinal, I mean, uh, uh, mental retardation, or uh, they'll be mentally cha challenged with uh, some physical features. If uh, Dr. Joseph is here, he can throw more uh, light on it. I think I can go to the next question, it's okay. Well, Joseph will come and answer. Okay, then uh, we have come to the end of this session and I thank everyone for their participation, including our audience. A very special thanks to our Dean, Prof. Roland, Prof. Lai, Prof. Win, the cha organizing chairperson, Prof. Eugene, and all our host speakers, in-house speakers, uh, two SOM students body, especially Alan and Kuhan, and also our uh, committee members, especially Dr. Insia, Suin, Punita, Dr. Prabal, and Dekain, and for the support in running this lecture series successfully. I will now invite the organizing chairperson, Prof. Eugene, to deliver his closing remarks or talk. Over to Prof. Eugene. Hi, I, 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 I won't say much. I will, only, I will only say that next month, we are having another talk on the 17th of July about Down syndrome how, what, where, and who to screen by a qualified uh, consultant, phytometanol specialist, and uh, about ovarian cysts and what to do. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, time is running. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'll end the meeting. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the members. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a nice okay. topic.